Now, we, we've just gone on a journey in the morning of um, understanding the scale of some of the devastation. And what we're going to do in, the, in this session, we've got seven speakers and we're going to break this in half. And this whole session two is about, I guess, the technologies, the how, some new and maybe some not so new of the cutting edge technologies that are uh, that you know, things like gene drives, things like biological controls, immunocontraception. And what the speakers are going to do is each of them has been working in these fields for, for, for um, a while and they're going to talk about how the application of these, these technologies fit to managing invasive species. And each of them is likely to present some quandaries. There's all kinds of quandaries and some of those we, we'll discuss later on. We'll raise in more detail in the third session some of the caveats, but we'll discuss them as well. So what we'll do is we'll, we'll have four speakers. Rather than have eight speakers in a Q&A or seven speakers in a Q&A, we'll have four speakers, then a Q&A for about 15 minutes, and then the last three speakers and a Q&A, and then lunch. So the first speaker, he says, reaching for his notes, is Andreas Glansnick, who is the CEO at the Centre for Invasive Species Solutions that just got a massive plug at the end of the last session. <laughs> um, just connecting the dots for all of you in case you missed it. And, and I'll invite you, Andreas, to come up and start. Right, thank you. Thank you, and just because we've got 13 minutes, I'm just gonna start my my clock so I don't go over. Um, look, I wanted to start by just talking about um, one of the key points made in the last session, which was around the need for collaboration, and particularly when you've got capability dispersed around the country and around the, the globe. And, and the story I'm going to be telling you is about today is about two things, is about the technology, but also how organisations and people have worked together uh, over the last uh, 20, 30 years. So I was asked to, to give a historical overview and then just set the scene for this session. Uh, so that's why it's uh, obviously going to be an overview. And, and for those that, uh, uh, that aren't sort of a fay with the last 30 years of, of, of research in this area, uh, there was this, our biocontrol story started in, in uh, 1919 when the myxoma virus was first uh, proposed as a rabbit biocontrol agent. In the gene drive or genetic sort of biocontrol side of things, uh, that, that story started when uh, there was some seed funding provided by the Australian government uh, to, to kick off the whole sort of genetic biocontrol side of things. But what I wanted to highlight here is two things is that on the genetic biocontrol sort of uh, uh, journey, there's been three major waves of genetic biocontrol. The first was uh, virally vectored immunocontraception, uh, the second was daughterless carp. Uh, and the third now that you'll hear sort of in, in depth is, is around gene drives and, uh, and that genetic tech. Uh, on the viral biocontrol side of things, it's been around focus on rabbits, carp and tilapia. And, and since the, the 90s, what I wanted to highlight is that the way that we've worked in Australia is, is by bringing a lot of organisations together into these large cooperative research centres. Uh, and in the case of so the Invasive Animal CRC, that's also brought in New Zealand uh, and the US. So it really is a, a global effort to try and land these big ticket technology sort of uh, options. So I think that I'll just sort of like just highlight again, uh, rabbits, uh, we were able to, through that collaboration, uh, is, is develop a first biocontrol agent in, uh, in 20 years. Carp, I mean, Argus will talk about uh, the work, the foundation work that was done on Cyprinid herpes virus and then how that's then, then been progressed through the National Carp Control Plan. And tilapia, Argus again will talk about the, the very important sort of work to develop um, understanding around the susceptibility of tilapia to a potential biocontrol agent, which is tilapia lake virus. That's what TLV stands for. But the common denominator at the organisational level uh, has been four cooperative research centres or a collaborative research centre. And you can sort of see that's our history. We've gone from the CRC for biological control of vertebrate pest populations right through to the invasive animal CRC and now the Centre for Invasive Species Solutions. 
So uh, because it won't necessarily be covered off elsewhere, I did want to sort of just make a, a, a sort of like a, a special mention for the, the very substantive work that was done on that first wave of genetic biocontrol uh, around virally vectored immunocontraceptives. Uh, the point that I want to sort of highlight is that that has all been wrapped up in a really nice sort of edited series uh, that was published through Wildlife Research. And, uh, and for those that are interested in this technology, I'd, I'd really recommend uh, that, that journal because it gives you a, a good overview. I think the key point here is that it was a big attempt, the first attempt to put in place a non-lethal strategic technology for foxes, rabbits and mice. Uh, it was sort of rolled out for at least mice and rabbits in terms of the proof of concept stages, but it, it just unfortunately the, the science couldn't deliver a practical product and for that reason it was pretty much rolled up uh, in the, the pest animal control CRC and there was a bit of residual um, work that was done to finish off the mouse work uh, in the invasive animal CRC. So I think that was a that was a big first wave, and it's, I find it really heartening that the next speaker will talk about the you know, how that that approach has been revitalised. So that's quite exciting. Um, in terms of the the Centre for Invasive Species Solutions, uh, collaboration matters, collaboration works, and it delivers impact. Uh, and I think the important point is what is central to to these large scale collaborations. In this case, it's a four legged stool. It brings together the Australian government with the states with industry through um, both research development corporations and commodity councils like wool producers, plus it brings together conservation in the NRM sector uh, in terms of, um, like in this case, Invasive Species Council, because they're here, Rabbit Free Australia, a suite of uh, universities in the CSIRO. So those collaborations are what enables us to deliver these large scale sort of uh, technology and research platforms. So I'll just mention two of the pipelines that are currently in train through the, the Centre for Invasive Species Solutions. The first is in, a, in relation to uh, a viral biocontrol. And the important point is that our approach is around innovation pipelines. So it's about putting in place the capability to work through, a, as a, you know, in a sense, a problem systemically to take you from ultimately a point of where we, where we landed it sort of after uh, the original release of Khaleesi virus in, uh, in, in the, in the mid-90s, and it was trying to sort of work through a, 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 a top-up, a, a more effective variant that could also work better in the temperate areas of Australia. So this sort of approach sort of highlights that we, we tend to work through 20-year uh, biocontrol pipeline strategies, and that's, uh, this is the one for rabbits. Uh, it also enables us to sort of not only work on the research and the, the tool, but also the delivery systems. In this case, it was a new freeze-dried um, uh, system that enabled us to very cheaply and widely disseminate uh, the biocontrol agent. I do want to sort of also highlight again the collaboration. You've got a, a, a Team Australia approach with the, the Commonwealth, the CSIRO, a whole bevy of uh, states, uh, as well as um, com community groups like Rabbit Free Australia and obviously industry, in this case through MLA and Australian Wool Innovation. Um, I think Ewan made a very good point this morning in his session to say uh, there is a, a, a very sort of close nexus between uh, foxes, cats and rabbits in terms of threatened species sort of conservation. And the important point here is that he mentioned that very important seminal work by Rhys Pedler and co that, that highlighted that rabbit biocontrol at landscape level is also very you know, effective landscape control for foxes and cats in central and southern Australia. So, uh, you know, the whole idea is that we've got to look at the, ultimately the, the system level uh, benefits you can get from any particular technology. The, the next sort of pipeline that I'd like to, to outline, um, and it's, it's probably going to be the headline act uh, today, is, is around genetic biocontrol. And, and to that end, um, the Centre for Invasive Species Solutions has really been working with our, with our partners to put in place a, a national uh, decision and investment framework. So that was completed uh, and, and released uh, a year or so ago. Uh, it was led by CSRO, but involved, obviously, the states and, uh, and a number of other NGOs. And the important point here is, again, rather than just working in, in parallel in our own respective silos, what we're trying to do with the National Investment Framework is bring everything together so we can ensure that we've got a, a strategic 
efficient way forward on this technology. Uh, the, I think the two key points that I'd, I'd like to bring out of the, of the current program is that the decision framework also enabled some prioritisation to get some agreed uh, priorities in terms of need as well as what is, is, is feasible from a technology point of view. So you can sort of see here you've got sort of targets of both, um, of both mice, uh, rats, uh, as well as rabbits. Uh, on the sort of the, 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 the fish amphibian side, you've also got carp, uh, foxes and, and feral cats. Uh, and importantly, there's cane toads are in that mix as well. Uh, and, and the other sort of key sort of point is that we've progressed the proof of concept work in two streams. One is trying to sort of look at, at mammal targets through a, a model. Uh, that's, that's the mouse, and Paul Thomas uh, from the University of Adelaide has been leading that work, and uh, we'll talk to that. Uh, on the other side, um, we've got sort of the, the fish model, which is zebra fish, uh, and that's also being investigated by Macquarie Uni, and so uh, they'll be talking later on today as well. So the point here is that we're making a contribution, but I will point out in the case of... Um, in the case of sort of the University of Adelaide, it is a Team Australia approach, and there's a lot of other investment coming going into uh, going into the University of Adelaide work. Part of that, I should also say, is is it's not just Australian investment; it's also US and New Zealand investment. Uh, it's also building on you know, research that's underway uh, globally. And the point here is that one of the key international collaborations in this space is is the genetic biocontrol of invasive rodents uh, collaboration. And you can sort of see that there are a number of, of key Australian uh, institutions involved. Uh, and we, as well as Macquarie University, are affiliates that sort of are working with one of the foundation members in this space, which is CSIRO. So the point here is that if you're going to sort of accelerate the, the whole innovation process, uh, it really matters to work collaboratively, to work within an international system where you can drive um, this technology forward. So where to from here? Um, the, what we've, we've landed, I suppose, and, and then Paul will talk to this, uh, is, is that University of Adelaide has done amazing work um, to, to land the world first gene drive mammal, uh, and I won't seal his thunder, but to say, to say the point that I'll say is that you know, within the context of a national decision and investment framework, what you've now got is uh, turning sort of like blue sky research that was, you know, like just let's say 10 years ago was the realm of science fiction into ultimately there's now a very sort of defined pathway to ultimately a practical technology for deployment. And that's what's proposed in the next five year uh, program that the centre is currently putting together with our partners and they're mentioned below. Uh, and I think there's three key elements to that. Um, I mean, firstly, it's about getting a, a, deploy a deployment uh, ready mouse prototype that you can then sort of see how the, the gene drive mouse could potentially work uh, within, within field conditions. Uh, the second is that we, if you now have a, a proven technology, so the opportunities to start to work to those other priority targets, in particular rats and, and rabbits, and CSIRO uh, are leading the rabbit work. Uh, and then finally, I'd like to also say that there's the opportunity to take that, that fish work uh, into uh, cane toads and all the, also other potential pest fish, which are you know the two prime targets currently are carp and tilapia. So where we're at, I suppose, as a centre, we're currently seeking co-investment to enable us to build that uh, that strategic uh, national Team Australia program, and uh, it's it's very exciting stuff. So I'll finish by just um, flagging that uh, that what we've got is a couple of things um, and. I just wanted to say that for those interested, particularly the rabbit biocontrol work, um, we've got a, uh, a a really nice sort of synthesis of all of you know the the, the benefits of rabbit biocontrol, the science, and so on. Uh, this is available on our website, but I do have a couple of copies at the front for any interested uh, attendees. Uh, and then for those that are also interested in that previous discussion, um, CSIRO as well as the centre put together a publication called. Um, Fighting Plagues and Predators, which again provides an overview of the problem, but very much it tries to set out the, the, the technology and innovation pathways to better tackle uh, the invasive species problem. Uh, and for those that don't know, um, we do have a, a, a trust, an Invasive Species Solutions Trust, 
Our patron is uh, Her Excellency Linda Hurley, uh, who's been in the media. You know, she's obviously winging away with... with... Okay. That's, that's me over and out. See, I'm self-regulating. Um, so, so she's our, our, our patron. Uh, we've, got a, we've got a trust. Uh, it's all about making a difference. And, uh, and, and to that end, I'll leave it there. And hopefully, um, you know, with collaboration, we can really land practical technologies that are going to turn the corner on our invasive uh, vertebrate pest problem. As an MC, you love self-regulation. Thank you very much, Andreas. So our next speaker is Dr. Tanya Strive from CSIRO. Oh, oops, sorry, beg your pardon. Uh, Tanya is leader of the host pathogen interactions research team in the CSIRO Biosecurity Flagship. And so over to you, Tanya. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for the introduction. Thank you to the organisers for giving me the opportunity to speak here today, and I too acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we meet here today. So I'll jump right in. Australia has successfully been using biological control of rabbits for over 70 years now. And um, the three main initiatives are outlined here. The first one was the myxoma virus that was released in the 1950s, followed by the subsequent introduction of two rabbit fleas to enhance the transmission of the myxoma virus, and then the first uh, rabbit Khaleesi virus that was released in the mid-90s. It's also called rabbit hemorrhagic disease virus, or RHDV, uh, and I'm going to call it that uh, from this point forward. And it's been estimated that um, between 1950 and 2010, the cumulative economic benefits from these initiatives exceeded $70 billion worth of savings to the agricultural industries. And that number is now over 10 years old, so it's a lot more than that. Others have uh, pointed this out before me, but um, obviously, in addition to um, the huge economic savings, there were massive, massive environmental benefits because rabbits are, as, as an invasive as they are in their native range, they are a keystone species. So in Australia, rabbits have very negative both top-down and, and bottom-up uh, effects. There is a lot of competition and land degradation caused by rabbits, but as we've heard before, rabbits also, large numbers of rabbits sustain large numbers of uh, uh, feral cats and foxes, which we know to be a, a key driver for mammalian extinction in Australia. And um, uh, Ewan mentioned this beautiful paper from Rhys Pedler and colleagues, you know, if you have to triage where you spend your conservation dollars to make the biggest difference, go for the keystone species. And getting to the rabbits is, is one of the best ways of pulling down the cats and foxes at a landscape scale. Despite all these enormous successes, uh, it's always important to point out biological control is never a silver bullet. It's just a virus never kills every single host. It just doesn't do that because the virus would cease to exist. Um, but what's, what's shown really nicely in this graph, which is from one of Brian Cook's papers, and we love it, we use it all the time, it shows both the, the massive impacts that the biocontrol initiatives have had on rabbit numbers, but it also shows that regardless what you throw at them, over time, they have a tendency to come back up again. And there is a, a multitude of reasons for that. One is building population immunity in the residual populations after the virus has become established. But there is also ongoing host pathogen coevolution that leads to heritable resistance development that can lead to build up over time as well. At the end of the day, though, what this means is, in order to protect these gains that were made, it is absolutely essential that we develop a pipeline of solutions, whatever it is, just some, to have something that we can uh, roll out every 10 to 15 years to make sure we keep numbers under this damage threshold, which is just an arbitrary line in here for illustration. That threshold can vary depending on the landscape you're in. So Andreas mentioned it before me, in line with this pipeline strategy, in 2017, we added another variant of the RHDV to the mix. It was, we referred to it as K5, and that was just a name. It is a naturally occurring virus variant, and it had some advantages compared to existing variants. Um, 
uh, and uh, I don't have time to go to go in, into any of these details. Um, the, the, the virus was released nationwide through over 300 community-led release sites, and it was accompanied by a national monitoring program to track its spread and impact. And as part of that, um, people could send us a piece of their dead rabbit, and we would analyze it for them. So there's a rabbit scan app, or you can go directly to the website. By the way, this, is still, this, this still exists, so if you have a dead rabbit, send it to us and we will tell you what killed it. Now, while the preparations were underway for this release, um, through the National Monitoring uh, uh, Network, we picked up the arrival of yet another RHDV virus in Australia. And it's actually not just a variant, it's a completely new rabbit Khaleesi virus. It emerged in Europe in 2010, probably from benign ancestors, non virulent versions. And it's quite different because it can come, it can overcome immunity to other virus strains. It can kill very young rabbits and hares as well. Uh, we first found it in Australia in 2015, but it became clear that it had been here for some time before that. And very quickly, it became the dominant strain in the Australian environment. And uh, the data suggests that it on, bell, on average, it led to a reduction of approximately 60% of wild rabbit populations across Australia, which is a great success. Um, however, we know, obviously, from the previous slide, it's not going to stay like this forever. So, and at this point in the piece where we're now, you know, 2018, and the uh, obvious question is, so what's next in the rabbit bar control pipeline? Um, is there going to be another emerging RHDV, three, four, five? Um, very, very possible, if, if not likely. So we know that virulent Khaleesi viruses have emerged in rabbits, at least, and hares, at least three times independently. Um, and I'm pretty sure it's going to happen again, but obviously we can't predict where and when that's going to happen. So what can we do? And there's actually quite a lot that we can do to move this forward. Um, and Andreas uh, 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 mentioned it, there is uh, a rabbit biocontrol pipeline strategy. This is the, the, the title cover of the previous version. Um, and it outlines a multi-pronged approach of short, medium, and long-term solutions, how we can tackle this problem. So we have just closed uh, a four-year project funded through the the previous Center for Invasive Species Solution that explored RHDV2 as an, uh, and as an additional registered biocide product. Um, the data suggested that that is probably not going to get an extra lot of benefit, mostly because of the very, very high level of population immunity and its frequent activity. Um, however, there is still a lot of room for improvement by optimizing what we have available. Uh, and integrating it better with conventional control methods, and that's a proposal that's currently under consideration. Also outlined um, in this strategy are several other medium and long-term strategies, and I'm going to spend the rest of my 13 minutes um, to outline a little bit what's, what's happening in that space. So medium term is uh, the search for new pathogens that could be used or the selection of better versions of existing uh, pathogens. And long term, there's obviously the novel genetic bar control technology that just looks too good to not be considered and explored for this. Regarding approach number two, the discovery of new rabbit pathogens, there is currently work underway uh, in my organization funded by MLA, where we're asked the question, what's actually killing rabbits, um, both in Australia and overseas, and could we potentially use this as the next biocontrol agent? So what we're doing is we use exploratory next generation sequencing approaches of unexplained lagomorph deaths. So that's rabbits and related lagomorph species, because we know that sometimes pathogens, virulent pathogens can emerge by jumping from a related species onto another species. And this work is underway, and we're finding lots of interesting things. So for example, hepatitis E in Australian rabbits, which we didn't know was here, and we're finding a whole bunch of new hep viruses in overseas lagomorphs. So at this point, none of these really, oh, this is great because it shows us that our method is working. It's really good for pathogen discovery. Uh, none of these stand out at this point as a super new suitable rabbit bark control. Um, but this project is ongoing, so uh, 
Who knows what else we will find? Number three, the option of selecting better RHDV strange, uh, strains. There is a, a project underway which we call RHD Accelerator, and that's, um, uh, that aims at just using principles of natural selection to produce immune escape mutants. So we know for, for decades we've known that if you grow virus in the presence of neutralizing antibodies, evolution will throw up variants that are not neutralized, and then by passaging you can enrich for those, and ultimately you will have a, a, an escape mutant, and you repeat this, and um, then you, you end up with a new serotype. You basically have a, a virus that can overcome immunity to existing strains, which would be a huge advantage, and it's also, uh, the, the, another advantage is that this is a, like a platform technology. So say if one, you have produced one, you get ready to get it registered and released, and at the same time, you can already start working on the next one. So if this all works, you theoretically have a, like a perpetual platform where you can crank the handle on and, and, and stay ahead in this race a little bit. Unfortunately, though, um, it needs a culture system and for many Khaleesi viruses, including those of rabbits, those systems have been lacking for over 30 years. But we've got some really exciting, very recent news on this. So as part of this project, we were able to develop a liver organoid culture system. Uh, and it's actually showing for the first time reproducible ex vivo replication of RHDV in culture. So on the left, there is a little, little organoid, a little little meatball in a dish, looks like a rabbit too. Uh, and below is, uh, is an immune fluorescence, and the green is uh, uh, indicating virus replication. So this, is, this needs optimization, upscaling, obviously. Um, it's not perfect yet, uh, but it's really, really exciting. And another exciting aspect of this is we can use this system uh, to investigate issues of species specificity without actually having to infect animals. So we have shown that RHDV1 grows in rabbit organoids, RHDV2 in rabbit and hares, and none of them grow in mouse, cat or fox liver organoids, which is really exciting. Number four, and most long term, and other people will speak more about it in the next session, um, novel genetic bowel control approaches such as gene drives, um, here illustrated like the, the simplest case that's often used, um, you know, all offspring turns male and ultimately the population will crash. Uh, there is a little bit of work underway uh, at our end and there is more work underway um, through other research partners, which we'll also hear about later in this session. So what's, what's happening at this end is um, we're doing a whole genome sequencing of Australian white rabbit populations because it's kind of essential background information to have and then we're subjecting that to gene drive genetic modeling. So that helps with the, the target selection, the, of the, the genetic target selection, um, specific sites that could be you know, specific to a particular population and risk assessment. Um, but going forward, we also want to, uh, we will commence working on, on actual drive mechanisms in rabbits uh, and do some target gene validation. And anyone interested in a postdoc in this area, please come and speak to me afterwards. Um, so I'll end with this slide. Um, it, it doesn't really matter what we do, but what does matter is that we keep trying and that we keep trying to investigate multiple different avenues. Um, and I don't know what the next thing is, accelerator, genetic bar control, something else altogether, a new virus that will emerge. It doesn't really matter. What really matters is that we do everything that we can to, to keep the area above the curve as big as possible for as long as possible, because that's, that's, it's about the rabbits that are not there. So it's, it's, that's where landscapes get a chance to recover. Thank you very much. And I don't want to linger on this slide, but I just want to at least put it out there. This is obviously a cast of thousands, and this only covers the last um, few years. This is a massive collaborative effort, has been and must be a, a massive collaborative effort to implement things at this scale. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Tanya. Um, I'm going to call you back up to, to come and sit at the end. Um, and, and that slide reminds me of a comment which I meant to make at the end of your talk, Andreas, and that is uh, the big take-home message for me from your talk was collaboration works. 
And here's another good example of that, I think. Um, and, and I've just got a couple of quick notes. Um, the, 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 I love the, if you have a dollar to spend, stop a rabbit. Like that was, <laughs> that I think is an excellent little quote. Uh, and also, I love the idea that there is a rabbit scan app. So if you have a dead bunny with an unknown cause of death, that you can scan it and send it off and someone will tell you what happened. That's quite remarkable. And then my final kind of um, take home uh, was the, this pipeline, this idea of the need of a pipeline. And I was struck by the idea, and we might, if I'm allowed in the questions, I might ask this, then what can we learn from that boom and bust um, pipeline of needing to have the next control mechanism every 10 to 15 years with these new and emerging tools? That's a really interesting question that we'll, I'm sure we'll pick up. So thank you so much. So um, our next speaker is Dr. Alan Cottingham from the University of Melbourne. Um, Alan is a postdoctoral researcher uh, in the School of Biosciences. Thank you. Thank Over you. To you. All right. Hi, I'm Ellen. So as Anth said, I'm from the University of Melbourne. And I'm going to talk about immunocontraceptives and their potential to be used uh, for feral cat management in particular. So we've heard a little bit about immunocontraception, um, and I'll just sort of delve deeper into what does that actually mean? What is immunocontraception? Well, the definition uh, is kind of in the name. So it's using the immune system to induce a contraceptive effect. So this could be in a situation where we have a reduced number of offspring. We could go from, say, having five offspring to two. That would be an immunocontraceptive effect. We might have reduced chance of fertilization happening between a, a sperm and an ovum. It could also be that the chance of offspring development is stalled. So maybe fertilization happens, but offspring progression doesn't occur. So in terms of the history of immunocontraception, because as was outlined at the start, it's, this has been around for a while, and some of the authors of the early work are here in the room, I believe. So um, the idea has been around for a while, and there was this group in the 70s who kind of were, I think, kind of one of the first groups that really started to identify that, in their words, you could use an immunological procedure for fertility control, and they investigated this in hamster. So what they did was they took hamster over, they raised antibodies against the ova, and then they tested submerging um, some ova with the antibody and others without. And then they tried to see whether or not they could um, basically fertilize those ova. So in the ova that were treated with antibody, no sperm could attach. So it turned out that the antibodies were actually against this layer called zona pellucida. Uh, whereas in the uh, um, hamsters ova with no antibody, fertilization happened. So since then, you know, it's sort of been a discussion on the need for more contraceptive options and management of reproduction for both humans and animals as well. So a really nice case study of this is the elephants in Kruger National Park in, um, in South Africa, I believe. So these elephants were doing really, really well. They were breeding up and there was, you know, these big populations. It was actually getting to the point where there were so many elephants that the, the environment was starting to suffer. They didn't want to cull the elephants, so what they did was they darted them with an immunocontraceptive, I think it was every sort of 12 to 18 months. And so this was fantastic because it meant that, you know, there was no elephants killed, but it also maintained the family structures of these elephants as well, and that was critical. So that's a little bit about the history of immunocontraception. I'd now like to shift back to talking more particularly around feral cats. So feral cats have been talked about a lot already. Um, but just to cover ex exactly just how bad they are, we've got anywhere from two to six million feral cats that cover the whole of our continent. There is nowhere in Australia that is exempt from the impact of cats. So one cat, this is estimated by the Australian Wildlife Conservancy, will kill about five to 30 animals a day, or usually in the evening, um, although I've sent, been sent video footage of a cat in South Australia and she had about 75 animals in her stomach that were identifiable. So this equates to about 75 million native animals lost a day with these sort of figures. Um, as mentioned, and I think it's just not talked about enough yet, is that they are not only a vector for toxoplasmosis, but they're also the primary reservoir for it as well. So as we heard from Gerald, you can have um, abortions in lamb, um, so for lambs and sheep flocks. It's also... Um, starting to be recognized as a major health problem for humans as well. So mental health issues, major one. Um, changes in behavior, as UN pointed out as well. So risk-taking behavior. Um, so it's just all around we have a big feral cat problem. Um, and we've spent almost $19 billion on feral cats since the 1960s. 
So in terms of what we do right now for feral cat control, most of the time it's lethal removal. So shooting, trapping, baiting, these sorts of things. Um, the Felix a grooming trap is a new invention that's sort of still in development, I believe. Uh, it's really interesting. It sprays a toxic substance onto cats when they walk past, and then the cats ingest that toxin as they groom themselves. Um, cats are uh, really hard to bait because they prefer live kill. They don't really like eating baits that have been buried. And, and this makes you know, it really hard to manage them. And really important to mention that with all of these, that there's you know, considerable welfare concerns. And as we think we'd all agree, is if we can offer control options with higher welfare outcomes, we should absolutely be looking into them. So I want to talk about immunocontraceptives, but virally delivered. So there's a lot of things to unpack when we would ever cons when we think about viral immunocontraceptives. So our group has been making viral immunocontraceptives for cats, and I'll just sort of walk you through exactly how we went about making them. So first, what we do is identify a reproductive target. So this is a reproductive gene. If it's damaged, if it's disrupted or missing, leads to a really big decline in the reproductive potential of that animal. So we take that gene and then we put it into a viral vector. We clone it into the genome of that virus. That virus is now called um, a recombinant virus, and in this case it's carrying this reproductive gene. So this recombinant virus is then allowed to infect the cat or the host, and what you hope happens is that the virus will get into the cells of that cat, it will start doing its thing, it will start replicating, but it will also start producing reproductive proteins that we've put into uh, this, this viral vector. Now, you, two things we hope happens is we hope that the host immune system will come along, they'll see this cell is infected with this virus, and see that it's producing reproductive proteins in that cell. And we hope that it recognizes those proteins as coming from an infected cell, so therefore virally produced, and something that should not be there. So what we hope is we get an adaptive or antibody response against those reproductive proteins that we've put in there. The second thing that we hope happens is that the host immune system is now no longer able to differentiate between what is virally produced and what's its own natural production of these proteins. So the immune system sort of turns around on itself and destroys its own reproductive potential. That's what we hope happens. So there's a lot of things to think about with something like this. One of the biggest things that we had in our mind when we were going through the development of such a technology is what viral vector do we use? So keeping in mind that we want to really, really maintain the highest possible welfare outcome for the cat at all times, we're proposing that we use feline herpes virus, and there's a number of reasons for this. So first of all, it's a really large DNA virus, so that might not mean much to people, but a large DNA virus allows us to stably integrate DNA into it. It also means that if it's a double-stranded DNA virus, it's likely to have very good repair mechanisms, which means unlike other certain viruses that have been spreading around the world in the last couple of years, it repairs itself and, and mutations don't accumulate quite as fast. So that's one good thing. Um, it achieves latency. So this is when it basically goes quiet and then it will reactivate upon certain cues. So this means if we had a reproductive virus that reactivated every time this, the cat was stressed or tired or perhaps pregnant or whatever, what have you, it would be like a booster contraceptive effect continuously for that cat. Um, and so, you know, the clinical signs for feline herpes virus, um, most of the vets that I speak to, when they, uh, they find out a cat is positive with herpes, uh, the cat doesn't even really show much of anything. Sometimes there's a bit of um, nasal discharge or runny nose, a bit of coughing, but it's very, very low. It's like having a very mild cold. So in that sense, as viruses go, this is a good option in terms of welfare outcome. Should also note as well that it has been studied extensively since the early 1990s as a vector for other feline pathogens. So it's very, very well characterized in terms of its ability to act as a vaccine vector. So we had the virus vector that we were interested in using. The next uh, question was which reproductive targets do we go for? So we settled on two, which are probably the two most famous reproductive targets in terms of immunocontraception and, and even w moving into gene drive soon too. Uh, so gonadotropin releasing hormone is a male and female um, related hormone. So in males, it, it triggers things like spermatogenesis. In females, things like oogenesis. So if you knock it out, uh, you get basically quite impaired fertility in that animal. Zona pellucida, on the other hand, is female specific. So the zona pellucida layer is this protein layer that surrounds the oocyte, and it's there to make sure sperm binding occurs. So if it's not there, sperm can't adhere, can't attach, fertilization can't happen. 
So we took feline herpes virus as the vector and these two reproductive genes, and we made the first fe uh, feline herpes virus immunocontraceptive. So you can see here in the sort of gray picture, these are cat cells. Um, I should also say, alongside these two reproductive genes, we put in green fluorescence as well so that we could see when the virus had been successfully modified. And um, oh, the optics aren't great, but hopefully you can see on the right here there's green fluorescence showing up where this infection is, which was an indicative, which, which was indicative to us that we had the first recombinant. And indeed, um, sequencing confirmed that. So this was the first uh, feline herpes virus immunocontraceptive. We've since made several more, um, and we're characterizing them extensively in vitro, and we'll be moving on to in vivo studies as well. So there's no other changes in this strain to the genome, which is um, something that's been an issue for other people making contraceptives in the past. So there's a lot of considerations when we're thinking about something like a viral immunocontraceptive. A lot of questions come to mind. The number one question I get asked is, what about my cat? So number one question across the board. But it's a really like important and valid question because cats are such wonderful companion animals for many of us. And many people worry about what would that mean if we release something like that here. So three things on the what about my cat point. The first thing is that Australian owners are excellent at vaccinating their cats at uh, kitten stage often. So it's usually against sort of three viruses of which one is feline herpes. So most owners already have their cats vaccinated against feline herpes. If there was more circulating herpes in the environment, this would mean the cats have protection against those clinical signs. Second of all, your cat should also be desexed. So if it does get it, you know, it's just a contraceptive. So, I mean, don't just rely on the contraceptives we're making. Do desex your cat as well. But, you know, you're welcome. Um, but, you know, we shouldn't think of it that way. But the third point that still gets me in trouble, it's sometimes apparently still controversial, is that your cat should be inside. It should not be roaming. If you let your cat outside, I guarantee you that it is killing animals every night. There is no question about that. So please keep your cat inside. That all means for their health as well, as well as yours too, with things like Toxo around. Um, but it also means that if they're not circulating and roaming, that they're not going to come in contact with feral cats. So the next question that's a really interesting one is, could the immunocontraceptives jump species? So obviously, after what we've all gone through in the last few years with COVID, this is a very important question. So feline herpes is a very interesting virus in a few reasons. I think it's interesting. Never thought I'd have strong opinions about a virus, but I do about this one. Um, it has never been found outside feline species, never confirmed to be outside of the feline range. Um, and it also has incredibly low sequence diversity globally. So if you took a strain from the US or from Japan or China, from Korea, from Australia, they're all very, very similar. This means, and the virologists in the room might have picked up on this, that recombination, if it does happen, Happen, there's not much diversity for it to swap. This doesn't mean it can't happen or it can't acquire new traits, but the traits that it would need to acquire to jump outside the cat host range are actually very well defined and it's actually very, very unlikely to occur. The biggest point in my mind, the biggest concern I have personally for this project is the other feline species. This is the big one. So we would always want to contain this in Australia. We're fine here. We don't have any native felines. But if, if this ever got out of Australia, which, you know, it's a virus, let's be honest, this is where stranger things have happened. What about the other felines? That's the most important thing. So we are looking at um, a new technique that's only been characterized in the last few years. It's called molecular switch technology. And it's, if you've ever used two-factor authentication on your phone, it's essentially like that. You basically stop the virus from being able to start replicating, start doing its thing. You put it under the control of one specific factor. So I'm proposing that this virus be put under the control of a domestic cat-specific switch, so that even if it did come into contact or close range of endangered felines, they would not be able to provide that domestic cat-specific protein that would allow the virus to start replicating. So that's one option. We've also got a few other ideas in the mix as well, but if anyone has any ideas on how to narrow and restrict to domestic cats, please let me know, because I would love any ideas and thoughts. I guess the thing that hasn't been talked about today, thank you, and that I would like to kind of end on is this point here, is that these viral immunocontraceptives are decades away and that they take really significant investigation and consideration. So some people get quite anxious, and I understand why, because they think, oh, we're just going to release something like this in the next five years, and that couldn't be further from the truth. So this is about coming up with options. I think the point of the symposium is showing what options we have available and w whether or not they might be appropriate is only going to become apparent in the next sort of 10, 20 years or so. So just to 
you know, reiterate there's no plans to release something like this. It's just about understanding if it's a viable option. So I'm going to leave it there, and thank you very much to our many, many groups, um, and happy to move on to the next speaker. Thank you so much, Alan, for yeah, a really thought-provoking talk. I, I, I'm so pleased that um, we won't go down as the country that released things that got rid of the tigers and the lions, <laughs> like it does. But I'm also intrigued, and, 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 and I think... That time scale, your time scale comment at the end is really important within the context of what Tanya was saying. That we're right, we need these pipelines coming through. That we need to be two decades ahead of the next um, um, intervention that might be required. So thank you very much. And I will... Now, um, before we... So after, after Argus speaks, we, we will um, we'll have a Q&A with, um, with the four speakers from this first part of the session. Uh, so, uh, Agus Sonato is our final speaker in the first half of this session. Agus is a senior research scientist at CSIRO um, working on genetic gene editing technologies in agriculture and aquatic species. So, being a marine ecologist by trade, I'm looking forward to this one. Thank you. Agus, all yours. Thank you for the opportunity to um, share our story on fish viruses, and thank you, Andrea, for setting the scene for the viral biocontrol in fish. So the first virus I'm going to talk is Cyprinid aerospirus, um, taxonomically known as uh, Cyprinid aerospirus. It's also known as Coiherpus virus, from which the first virus isolated. In Australia, it's known as the calf virus. So this is a typical uh, Coiherpus virus outbreak in calf cause high mortality in carp and significant economic losses to the farmer. So um, safety and efficacy, as you know, is the major concern for any success of viral biocontrol. And um, we need to take this into consideration before any exotic viral biocontrol to be considered. So in terms of efficacy, um, in 2007, part of my PhD when I came here, um, we isolated new genetic lineage of Indonesian CO7 isolates, which proved to be uh, virulent, caused high mortality in carp sources from Australian waterways in laboratory setting. We don't know yet how it performs in the field, considering all the environment, um, um, temperature, fluctuation, and so on. In terms of Safety, uh, can we call uh, lead this project initiated that uh, viral bio control in CARP and did fantastic job on the non target species testing. So, 22 non target species has been exposed to the virus, no clinical sign of disease, no mortality, 100, well, sorry, 1,000 sample tested, and no evidence of viral infection within with the virus. Just would like to point it out here, and this is the messenger RNA detection. So there is no evidence of um, positive messenger RNA indicating there is no viral replication in the host. There is no viral infection in the host. So the most uh, compelling of evidence probably since the virus was reported 2005 years ago to 25 years ago, the disease has never been reported anywhere in the world in any species other than Cyprinus carpio. So carp and koi belongs to the same species, Cyprinus carpio. Of course, not everyone supports uh, biocontrol of carp, and we appreciate that. But safety and efficacy is just a small part of risk assessment, which is part of the national cap control plan. So the NCCP is one of several uh, important input that will inform a decision by the government on the cap virus. Uh, understandable, the final decision of cap virus will require further um, consultation and regulatory approval. If the virus approved for release, 
this what modeling so so the modeling suggests that oil helpers virus by control will knock down the number of cup significantly but it slowly will recover a combine of biocontrol and genetic control as we know it is a better approach for effective uh, cup control so we have opportunity to have a small workshop with Jawaharlal Patel, uh, Makti Sat, and Majib Maselko and um, identify in addition to CAP, uh, to the other CAP that Ron Tracer developed a few years ago, is Trojan Y chromosome, a gene drive that um, Paul and Chandran are going to talk today. Sorry, Chandran are going to talk the self-stocking input, input compatibility mill system. This uh, genetic te technology is a brute uh, control option that complementary more virulent strain of Cyprinid FS virus in the future. So the second virus that I'm going to talk is Tilapin virus Tilapia, also known as Tilapia lip virus. This is a uh, Tilapia lip virus outbreak in Israel in 2013, in uh, close to the Kinneret Lake, when the virus first isolated. Uh, thanks to Andreas and Kiss, we had opportunity to um, do bioprospecting, and we found that tilapia lake virus is the most uh, promising biocontrol agent, and tilapia parvo virus is considered as tentatively worthwhile. Um, the reason is because tilapia Parvo virus just re recently emerged in China and recently uh, discovered in Thailand, but we don't know much information about the virus. So I'm not going into detail um, how we did the assessment, but we have a robust selection criteria and we check, um, for example, bacterial, fungi, parasite are not species specific to tilapia and therefore were assessed as not suitable as a biocontrol agent candidate. So we focus on the three viruses that originally isolated from tilapia, tilapia lake virus, tilapia parvo virus, and tilapia encephalitis uh, virus. So tilapia larvae encephalitis virus has only been discovered in hatchery and in Israel decades ago, and there is no subsequent report. So we don't know how effective it will be in adult tilapia, for example. Uh, tilapia parvo virus uh, seems good, but it has only been reported in farm tilapia, but not in a wild. So we don't know how it will perform in um, wild fisheries. Tilapia lake virus looking good. Um, we got some positive uh, score there, but Viral biocontrol agent has never been used or approved for use for aquatic invasive species. So the expected delay due to public and government approval for viral biocontrol is a major concern. And that's why we put um, public government, public and government approval requirement as a major concern here. However, as we know, we have very strong legislation, Biological Control Act 1984, which uh, can facilitate the process. So in terms of safety, this is outbreak again in Israel. Uh, Kinneret Lake hosting 27 species, but tilapia lake virus only affected tilapia, but not other species, suggesting species specificity of this virus. So tilapia belongs to Cichlidae, which is a non-native Australian family. In terms of efficacy, tilapia lake virus is virulent in tilapia, cause high mortality in uh, tilapia. It also decreases wild tilapia population in Kinneret Lake, so we know that it's work in the wild fisheries. Um, reproduction, reproduction number 2.5, so thanks to COVID, we know what it means. Um, so in terms of biological control, if we introduce tilapia lake virus, into tilapia population, most likely it will spread 
and the disease occurrence will uh, increase over time. So we are now in, co in collaboration with James Cook University. So James Cook managed to breed two species of tilapia, uh, Mozambicus and tilapia, and um, we are going to test the fish in uh, AMAI in collaboration with, AM, uh, with AMMA as a proof of concept whether this tilapia sources from Australian waterways is susceptible to the tilapia lake virus. So what take home message is I hope I cover a story of viruses from aquaculture space as a potential biocontrol agent for invasive carp and tilapia here in Australia. And safety and efficacy of viral biocontrol is a major concern and we need to take that consideration before any uh, agent is considered. And I combine viral biocontrol and genetic technology for effective carp and tilapia control. Again, this is a big collaborative project and I will thank you um, everyone and collaborator and funding agent and also uh, RSV for invitation to um, join the meeting and perfect scheduling. So see you at the MCG. <laughs>
for a long time. I think what I worry about is that we'll get to a stage where we have these options and then sort of dump it into the public consciousness that these are things we're thinking about. No one's had time to really think, settle, reflect on it. It's really interesting too, and I think just at a meta level, the the fact that you're what what I'm what I take out of that is there's this, that you need to spend purposeful time, effort, and energy on that engagement. So if you had ten slides, one of them was about that, mm. uh, and so that's actually part of the, the story. Tanya, you look like you want to jump in, and then we'll come to you guys down here. Uh, for for us in the in the rabbit bar control space, um, the, our main interface where we interact with the public is actually when we report out those test results, and we deal with quite a few like grieving pet owners who've lost their pet rabbits. Um, and it's exactly as Ellen said, it's, it's you know, understanding and validating their point of view, but um, getting the consistent message across that there is a very big difference between feral rabbits uh, and domestic rabbits. Uh, and we give them biosecurity advice as well. Um, and that I think goes a long way of, of at least um, ensuring a little bit of, of social acceptance or understanding that there is actually a difference between the two. Um, but beyond that, uh, that, there is obviously a lot more that, that can be done and, you know, getting them early and starting educating people early, getting it into the national cur curriculum. And before this, I would probably palm this off to Andreas because I'm sure, um, you know, he has a lot to say about this as well. Uh, so. And I suppose we've got some, some hard experiences like the, the release of the rabbit biocontrol agent in 2017. Look, I'd like to just echo the, the discussion that happened in the previous session. At the end of the day, it's about value-based communication. And generally, um, and, you know, the most successful communications are about value alignment. So in the case of urban audiences, it's about lining up with the threatened species that you're trying to protect and, and, and their, their global importance. Uh, and a lot of the sort of NGOs, I mean, they'll use that flagship-based communication style to uh, just to communicate. For example, if you're eradicating 150,000 rabbits off Macquarie Island, you lead with the albatross. Um, and that was my last campaign when I worked for the World Wildlife Fund um, and getting that one across the line. I think that if I, if I also share some, some social market research that was done through the, the former Invasive Animals Copy Research Centre, um, what came out constantly as, as, as a key um, worst invasive animal was the cane toad because in a sense that they don't have that many redeeming features for, for most Australians. But what was really interesting for me, what came out number two was feral cats. And uh, if you look at say what was happening in, in Europe and the US, uh, is cats are, you know, they've, they've got a far stronger, um, how do I say, like constituency, whereas in Australia we, we tend to better differentiate between domestic cats versus feral cats. Uh, and I think that's why there is a, there's more social license about feral cat management uh, in Australia than say what, what occurs, you know, for example, in the US and, and the UK. Uh, so I think that's, the, that's the, the second point. The third point I wanted to share was, was about when we were gearing up for the, and when I say we, it's Team Australia, so it's, it's Australian state governments, it's CSIRO, it's a NRM groups and the like, but we're gearing up for the national release of, of that new strain of Khaleesi virus in 2017. And what was instructive is that was the first release uh, of a, of a vertebrate pest biocontrol agent in the age of social media. And so we were really having to sort of try and, you know, we had to manage that, in a sense, social media um, issue. And so you're getting a lot of, uh, communications coming into the then CRC, and I know that was also happening around uh, in government agencies and CSIRO, where particularly rabbit pet owners were able to to mobilise and use that platform. Uh, I mean, I suppose like our, our strategy there was to really work closely with particularly the RSPCA and uh, and the the Australian Veterinary Association to make sure that there was really good sort of communications around animal welfare, uh, but also. The important and one of the key messages was that if you're a domestic rabbit owner, all you need to do is vaccinate your rabbit. And and what we found out through, you know, the, the campaign was that there are a lot of rabbit owners, pet rabbit owners out there that hadn't vaccinated their rabbit. So we were able to sort of, you know, in a sense, provide a a response which was responsible pet rabbit ownership requires you to to vaccinate your rabbits to protect those rabbits. 
uh, and that was reinforced by the you know by the communications also coming from the veterinary association as well as the RSPCA. So so I think that to, to sum it up, um, as we move forward, it's important that you know we, you don't just drop the technology on on society. It is a journey, and and this is part of you know this is part of that that journey in sharing uh, the you know the blue sky technologies as well as our standard technologies, uh, and it's about ensuring that people understand the value proposition, that understand that this is ultimately about protecting biodiversity assets, protecting uh, livestock assets, and, uh, and at the end of the day, we want an Australia that has a, that, you know, that we can identify with, that has a, you know, that we, that has Australian bush rather than say, you know, uh, just trounced by various vertebrate pests and weeds. So I think that's, you know, that, that is where I'll leave it by just sort of mm. going back to sharing about what we're trying to care for, what we're trying to protect. Thank you. Thank you. I guess from an aquatic perspective, is it is there a is there a different community? Because you know we, Australians are mad fish yeah. fishers, you know, and so you know, is there a whole other conversation that has to happen with the aquatic users? Yeah. So in uh, part of the NCCPV, um, lucky to have social scientists who did a survey on the people perspective on viral biocontrol, and um, there is interesting result of the survey. So people who live in the regional area along the Maridali Basin, for example, they more um, uh, supported for the viral biocontrol program, but not city folk. Don't get me wrong. My daughter who got the ticket studied at Melbourne Uni, and we had quite different perspective in our household. So yeah, mm. the discussion, I think yeah. it's um, difference depend where you are talking to people when the people come from, what their background are, and so on. So, mm. yeah, quite different uh, and I guess. There's, a, there's also, from many years ago in a different life, I was involved in conversations about some of the release of some of these viruses, and you showed a graph where there was a 80% mortality rate within 10 days. And I remember speaking to a group of um, uh, water corporations that ran water filtration in country towns and said, gosh, what do we do when all those dead fish come, you know, floating down the creek. And so there was that whole other conversation about how you'd have to change just the, the town water supply management, you know, and so there's a whole whole range of those conversations. Kat, we're going to go online and hopefully we're not going to... Yep. <laughs> um, we have a question from Penny that's specific to the idea of immunocontraceptive agents, but I actually might just expand it. Sorry, Penny, microphone privileges. Um, so the question is kind of asking, it's all very well to say, you know, this works in a lab, it's lab proven. How do you get that into bait or another delivery method? And then like, how can you guarantee it's going to work in the field? Oh, that's such a good question. It's the million dollar question. <laughs> it's really, really hard. Yeah, absolutely. You're so right. Um, so thinking about, you know, this stuff is so preliminary right now. So it's still really, really basic first in vivo trials. Does it actually is it safe, first of all? Is it not going to cause much disease? Is it a good contraceptive? And then we start to work on how would we, inst like, you know, try to disseminate something like this through Australia. Um, so the, there's a few options that we're looking at, and we've kind of tried to manage both options. So one is that the virus spreads from infected cat to infected cat to infected cat, and each cat, as they receive it, becomes infertile or has a contraceptive effect. That's one option. It might be in 10 to 15 years that we're just not comfortable with that as an option. That's very, very likely. Um, it's just it's just it's too risky for some of the reasons I outlined in the talk, in which case we have what's called a vaccine variant. So it's, it's the same virus, but it's been attenuated to make it more like a vaccine. So in that case, it could be darted. It could be uh, put into non-lethal baits. It could be Someone even suggested, um, you know, like crop dusting. I'm not sure if that would work. Um, I, I don't, that's not my idea. That was someone else's idea. Uh, I mean, there's so many options. And again, if anyone has an idea, any ideas, please let me know. That's going to be a really big question. We're just trying to figure out if they work, first of all. So we'll, we'll get to that hopefully, you know. Does, do any other speakers, in terms of any of the other topics you talked about, um, do you want to pick up the same question about how do you take it from the lab into the field? I know a lot of what you talked about, Tanya, is in the field. Mm -hmm. But the, those considerations of what needs to happen in that safety and efficacy? Not much to add to what Ellen said. Um, I mean, 
it's the holy grail, uh, remote delivery, oral delivery, and then self-dissemination. Um, but there is also the catch-22 that comes from wanting something that self-disseminates, because that's the only thing that will work at a landscape scale, but also wanting something that is safe and controllable. And those two are fundamentally different. Mm -hmm. So um, you, you can't have it both, unfortunately. That's not really possible. So mm. it's exactly as Alan said, you see, you find, you find out what works, and then within that you can you, know, you, you can see where within that spectrum it falls and that will determine its usability. And it, I hope it goes well. I keep all fingers crossed for you. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I started to work on BBIC on foxes when I first came to Australia, so I have a very, very strong interest in seeing how this pans out. But even if it doesn't end up being a, a landscape scale fix-all for cats, even if it's a... Uh, you know, even if you have to bring it to each an individual cat in order to achieve the effect, if that was the compromise, there might still be a room for a tool like this in the toolbox for certain circumstances. Mm -hmm. We've got a question in the room up the back. Hi. I'm interested to know whether or not you're talking about immune contraception, i.e. a time-limited effect on fertility, or immune sterilisation, a lifetime impact on an individual animal because it goes to the heart of the effectiveness of the process. And the other one is the potential for um, immune resistance to the process. Yeah, absolutely. So I think there was a few questions in there. Um, I'll try and remember them, but please remind me if I miss something. So we're talking about contraception versus sterilization. So contraception could be just a general decline in fertility. It doesn't mean that they don't produce offspring, could be less. So that is certainly one option that we would consider a very good outcome. So if you think about a cat, they might have five kittens. Um, realistically, in the Australian outback, most of those kittens are not going to make it to adulthood and do their thing. So that would be a good outcome. In the case of attacking something like Zona pellucida, so if we think about female biology, eggs are produced at birth and they're not replenished each time. So if you had a good, strong contraceptive effect, you could actually knock out all of those eggs at one time. So that would be full contraception, full sterility, sorry. Um, and I'm so sorry, what was your third question? The third question related to the the um, vehicle uh, for yes. delivering that and yep. the chance of immunity developing to that. Yes, yes. So this is another big question that comes up. So does prior exposure to something like feline herpes virus, in my case, does it stop this being effective? So if that's prior vaccination or if it's prior exposure. So feline herpes virus, and I didn't get to talk about this in the talk, does, so infection with herpes virus, doesn't matter if you've been infected before, you will get reinfected. It just means that your symptoms in our case or in the cat's case clinical signs will just hopefully not be as prominent so prior exposure does not prevent reinfection yes, thank you um we've got a, one more question in the room then we'll go back online uh, my question is about what happens if you succeed so you mentioned with the fish as an example and i know that was a concern with carp that if this thing works and it works really well and quickly you will have a whole river that's full of dead fish, which will absolutely trash the the, the aquatic nature of that, that system, right, in terms of the oxygen and all those sort of things, right? And so what modelling is done to look at scenarios where you actually succeed and say, okay, if all these tilapia die or all these carp die, what might happen to the invertebrates, the fish, the frogs, everything else that's using that system over that same time period? I might build on that too on the way through as the question goes through. Um, most of those will be being prey for something else as well. And so the predator prey relaxation. Yeah. So who would like to? I mean, we can take it from the aquatic perspective and then take it from terrestrial. Yeah, very interesting question. And that's also part of the NCCP. So we have a, a ecologists who are working on that area. So to, um, to assess what the risk of Black death, if you like, or black water yeah. result from the mortality. So um, we don't expect that there will be suddenly million carp die in one day, for example. And there is a risk assessment on the water quality as well. So um, I guess, yeah, it's a very interesting question, but I guess we have a modeling on that as well. So um, I'm not 
directly involved on that area. But yeah. what I can say is we do have a plan in place yeah. to um, to at least predict what is going to happen when we release the virus. Yeah, yeah Andres. I'll, I'll just add to that. I mean, and, and we sort of like handed the baton over for the carbon the Carp Biocontrol Program to the Fisheries RDC uh, in, in, in 2017. So what I want to say, though, is that under, like what we were funding in that, in that first tranche was very much around um, target specificity and susceptibility trials. Mm -hmm. The unfunded bit was all around the, you know, your question, which was the ecological risk assessment and so yeah. on. And, and that was the, the focus of, of, you know, a focus of the National Carp Control Plan, as you know. And, yeah. and the, the point that I wanted to say is that there are a lot of, in a sense, um, I mean, there was a field trial, I mean, just looking at trying to understand you know, real, you know, real field data that you could feed into the model. So it wasn't just a theoretical exercise. Uh, and second, the second point I want to say is, um, you know, this was a pro like a program that kicked off uh, in around about 2006 or even earlier. Uh, and it's you know it's still got a long way to go in terms of uh, the, the policy and regulatory considerations, the risk assessments under the Biological Control Act. It's an extremely robust process, and so um, and if I can then just share you know the mixed mitosis story. I mean, as Andrew flagged, the, the research started in, in around about you know, 1925 or 26. Uh, it was only it took 25 years before it was released. So these are you know, these are big ticket items. They're strategic controls, uh, and there's a lot of hoops that you've got to work through uh, before no, you get a, a, a decision to release. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I, as an ignorant observer, it was interesting to sort of see the debate. I was just going to say, as a, as a somewhat ignorant observer, as a scientist looking at the sort of debate within the scientific community about that that project, I thought it was interesting. So you know, to sort of weigh up those those risks. Yeah. Kate, we'll go to a question online. Um, well, while Mike's taking the mic across there, it, it is interesting in that, that we've created a huge impact in the environment that we're trying to fix, and in doing it, we've got another untested, you know, <laughs> experiment that will happen in undoing it, which is just, anyway, so can. Oops. Okay. Um, Sam asks if any of these biocontrols are really successful and then you eliminate a particular animal, um, may there be any potential unintended effects on the ecosystem and, and how are we accounting for that? And I just want to tie in that Sharon said earlier in the morning, asked a question, couldn't get around to it, sorry Sharon, but some invasive plants, for example, can be, you know, quite, um, it can be needed in an ecosystem. So um, what if we remove an animal? Yeah, so if we're extending the unintended consequences, Tanya or Alan to yeah, pick up the... Yep. Yep. Um, yep, so this is kind of mirroring the uh, question by Ewan, and I think it actually uh, was highlighted really well in Ewan's presentation that you could have all these, um, you know, undesirable species, but what if we take out foxes and then the cats just shoot up and then they, you know, go out. So what I would imagine we will a situation might look like is, let's say, 10, 20 years, we have these biocontrol options ready, we would I would imagine we'd, ha we'd pass it off to the ecological modelers to say where the controls are dropped, when they're dropped, and it's a, basically a coordinated effort across multiple sort of factors. Because that's the whole thing. If we take out, let's say they say, you need rabbits gone first. So we say, okay, we would handle rabbits. And then and at this point, we, we try and get rid of foxes. So I'd imagine it would be a lot of the ecological modelers and population dynamic modelers that will, will direct us on when and how that part. And I'd imagine too that there'd be the different landscape uses that it would need to have. So the park managers and the and the farmers, and that you know you'd almost have to, you know, coordinate that. Did you want to add anything, Tanya? Yeah, for with regards to unintended mm. consequences, there's at least a, 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 a there is a process to at least partially assess that as part of the registration. Is the so it, it's a consideration under the EPVC Act, and that looks at such possible unintended consequences for the road bar controls concerns that were raised with, for example, what happens like to little eagles um, who use rabbits as a, as a prey, or what happens to um, prey switching. So if we suddenly remove the rabbits, are the inv invasive predators going to hammer all the other native animals? Mm -hmm. And that's, that was thoroughly assessed. So the outcome was for the, for the prey switching. I think that any such effects are usually short-lived and uh, yeah. neutralised over over the long term, um, and the, the effects are actually 
the opposite. So mm. that process may not be perfect, but there is a process to look into these things. Should we take, yep, we'll take one more in the room, I reckon, and then we might have to jump to our next three speakers. Yeah, thanks, guys. Excellent presentations. Um, maybe, Tanya, you mentioned um, you initially started out on foxes and you're interested in um, where the research of Ellen's going. But this is more of a question around, you know, we've had great biocontrol success for rabbits. Is it purely a function of funding and time period we've been in the game? So when considering into, you know, how, how could we do the same for foxes. Is it just purely the amount of research that's going, gone into this and the time and how that might transition to other invasive species? Uh, no, um, I hope I understand your question correctly. Um, so time and research and continuity of research is absolutely essential. However, uh, with rabbit bar control, the success that we've had was largely due to the emergence of two types of viruses that were enormously suitable to the task. And um, where, you know, additional funding will help trying to find such viruses and perhaps select for them for other species, but we're not in a position where we um, can make viruses from scratch that do exactly what we want them to do. And if you think about this from a different angle, that's actually a good thing, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Um, uh, so um, the answer is yes and no. So you can absolutely speed things up and make sure you don't miss anything. Uh, however, the you know the myxoma virus and, and in particular the Khaleesi virus has set the bar very very high as to what is a really safe and um, effective. And if you compare it to other control methods and other viruses, it's actually relatively humane. Uh, consider, or other options considering. So you do need a little bit of serendipity there as well. We really, we really want to hear from Andreas about this, but just I just want to clarify one thing. So, so dollars, time and knowledge. But I'm also wondering, was it when you said the two that emerged, was that luck or was it research and luck combined that they emerged, those two new strains? It's luck. Research right. and okay. continuity of yep. research yep. puts you in the position where you can jump on it and yeah, get yep. it straight away. Thank you. But Andreas, yeah, do you want to build on this topic? Oh, no, well, just, just to say, um, it, it was luck, and I was just going, it's like it's like being strike scenario, and, and when a, you have a, a, a disease that emerges, and, and that's that's a rare gift and from a from a, you know, from a vertebrate pest biocontrol point of view. And, and for I'm that, glad you qualified that one, yeah. yeah. <laughs> But, and then from that point of view, that, that's where, you know, you're looking at, say, the Cyprian herpes virus, or you're looking at, say, Tilapia Lake virus, Mixo or, or Khaleesi virus. Uh, they, don't, they don't come up very often. And, and when they emerge uh, and they have, you know, they, they show they've got potential, uh, if they're going to sort of develop or generate a, ultimately a, a, a landscape level conservation or, or, or production benefit, they're, they're worth investigating. So I think that's that's the, the key point. And from a science point of view, it's that's why it's quite vital to have a bioprospecting sort of dimension to your research, so that you're monitoring sort of uh, incidences of of disease globally, and you're always sort of scouring for potential options. And Argus showed that slide where they you know they so sort of then systematically went through a whole suite of potential biocontrol sort of options, and then you 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 that's your, that's the start of your of your desktop screening assessment to identify you know, possible candidates to take forward. Thank you very much and thank you to all the speakers. We're going to move to the next speaker, so if we could just... <laughs> thank you very much. Now we have three, three more speakers bu building on this same topic, which is solutions, technologies, ways of us looking at new ways of control. The first of our next three speakers is um, Dr. Chan, uh, Chandran Fitzner, and I knew I'd get that wrong, sorry Chandran, um, who's a postdoctoral research fellow at, the, at Macquarie University working on strategies of genetic biocontrol for inv of invasive vertebrates. And I'll pass this over to you. Uh, thank you. Um, so yeah, I'm Chandran, I'm from the uh, Applied Biosciences Department at uh, Macquarie University. 
So yeah, I'm just going to be talking about one of the technologies we can use for controlling invasive fish, or in this case, carp in particular, um, one of the genetic biocontrol systems, which is called self-stocking incompatible male system, or SIMS for short. There's a lot of long acronyms in here, fortunately. It's uh, the nature of science, unfortunately. Uh, yeah, so uh, I'm just going to basically just jump straight in and explain how the system works. Um, and it's basically, it's, it's a combination of two genetic technologies um, with the idea for controlling European carp and other invasive fish. Uh, the first um, is this thing called engineered genetic incompatibility. Um, and it basically means here, so if you've got wild fish here, they can obviously mate with each other, they produce offspring. Um, if we make these Sims fish over here, uh, when they try and mate with each other, they actually don't produce any offspring, any, any offspring dies. Um, the other genetic technology is called conditional female lethality. Um, and that basically means that when we make these Sims fish over here, any offspring that they produce are all going to be male. Um, they don't produce any females. Um, and the general idea is to like, release these into like, an ecosystem with invasive carp. Um, and the competition between um, the breeding between the different lines leads to the decline of wild fish. So what does it look like when you, if you were to drop some of these Sims fish into like a, a lake or something like that? Initially, you have a population of females and males. Um, over time, uh, they can reproduce with each other. They produce only more males. Um, no more females are made. Um, and over a long period of time, um, just through natural death and the life cycle of the, the fish, uh, the first generation of fish die, which includes all the females. So the only things that are left are actually males. And again, because they can't rep reproduce, they decline over time as well. Um, so this kind of just uh, um, exemplifies two important points about this, in that it's, it's self-amplifying and it's self-limiting, um, which is the self-amplifying is important because it reduces the amount of fish you really need to drop into the lake at the start, reduces the cost um, and like how much you need to make and that kind of thing. And the self-limiting is important as well because you don't really want these fish staying around for any period of time. It also protects against if um, there's any kind of escape into another ecosystem or something like that. You don't need to worry about them causing problems because they'll eventually die out by themselves anyway. Um, so this is uh, basically the idea of how it works um, hypothetically. So we want to see, um, we want to model this system in real lakes um, with computer modeling to see if it would actually work or not. Um, so I'm just going to quickly go over some of the details of the modeling we did here um, and the specific conditions we, we used. Uh, so one important thing to talk about is if um, we use this in combination with like um, conventional technologies as well, um, like poisoning and things like that, um, which they're really good at um, reducing the population of fish down like 99%, wiping out 99% of the fish. But trying to get that last 1% is almost impossible by like the conventional methods. And if you don't get that last 1%, then they'll bounce back and just large population again. Um, so what we did here, we, took, we simulated a 100 hectare lake. Um, we reduced the population of those carp down to about 100 um, by conventional means. Um, then we, we stopped the lake with these Sims carp. Um, and we tried it. We, we modeled, modeled various different um, stocking rates, so from zero down to 600 fish um, in a single lake. Um, the idea was then to eliminate uh, the carp. And we can see over here the graphs of what is happening, and we compared it to a couple of different um, genetic technologies as well. Um, the y-axis has like the carp biomass, which is like kilograms of carp per hectare, and the x-axis is the number of years. And here you can see down the bottom right is essentially what conventional treatment will give you. you. You can wipe out the population slowly, but then it just bounces back and you don't get um, any kind of controlled population. I'll skip over the other ones for now, just in the interest of time. But when we model sims, um, uh, another important point here I forgot to mention, um, and Tanya mentioned this as well, I think, in her talk, and it's about um, not so much wiping out the population, but getting it to an ecologically tolerable level. 
Um, and so it's like once once the amount of carp stays below a certain level in in the in the lake, you don't really have any sort of ecological damage from them. Um, and that is estimated on here at the 100 kilograms per hectare in this this size lake, and that's that dashed line there to showing what would be ecologically um, sustainable, basically. So, and we can see that at the various different stocking rates of zero to 600 fish. The lower ones don't really work, but once we get it up over 600, um, we can see this black line here, it actually stays under this um, ecologically tolerable level and, um, yeah, just stays there forever, essentially, if we keep restocking those fish. Um, so it kind of shows that from a modelling perspective, it, it can work either like more, more as a, not so much an elimination strategy, more like a prophylactic barrier kind of thing to prevent the rise of these populations and causing damage um, to the ecosystem. Um, so now I'm just going to go into sort of how we actually make this kind of fish because um, that's really the big thing. You've got to make a fish that can't produce, reproduce a wild type and it can only make um, our offspring. Um, just in the interest of time because um, there's a lot of detail in this, I'm just going to go over the, the, the system that prevents them from mating with each other. Um, and yeah, so this is... Sort of an overview, a very dense slide, but I'll just go through the, the details here of, of what we do to try and make this. So a key part of this is we've got to find um, a developmental gene in the wild fish, which is signified by this arrow here, where if we make a, we force the fish to make a lot of this, um, this gene, then it will basically cause a lethal, a lethal amount of expression and they die. Um, and for the, the people who aren't familiar with sort of the genomics of this kind of thing, like when you express, what, what the thing that controls how much um, of this gene is produced is sort of the, the area upstream of the gene in the genome here, like the, the promoter. So the first thing we do is we actually, we, mut we mutate this promoter just using CRISPR technologies um, to change it slightly, as uh, signified by the red bar here instead. Um, and I'll, I'll explain why we do that in a second, but basically that doesn't actually change anything in the fish. That's still a perfectly healthy fish, doesn't cause any issues. Um, and the next step is we integrate a new transgene, which is indicated by this bit up here, um, which is actually a gene that is, contains a programmable gene activator, um, and it can specifically target locations we want. Um, so we make it so it targets this, um, this wild promoter here in front of the gene. Um, but what it doesn't do is it doesn't target the mutated promoter we've got in our fish here. So again, although we've got all these mechanics in this fish, um, this is a perfectly fine and healthy fish. It, it doesn't cause any problems to the fish. The problem, well, the, the good thing is that once then we cross this, this fish here we made with a wild fish, um, the, the offspring will contain one copy of this gene with the mutated promoter here and one copy without. Um, and that allows this programmable gene activator to bind to the target on the wild promoter, which is not present um, in this mutated here or, or up here, and basically cause uh, a lethal amount of um, expression of this gene here and, and leads to its death. So I'm just going to show a little bit of the data as well to show sort of how, how this is going along. Um, is the key here really is finding a developmental gene um, which will cause lethal overexpression. Um, it's, it's not everyone's going to work. You've basically got to test out a whole heap of different genes to try and get the right amount and the right one. Um, so we can do this in zebrafish, and um, that's, yeah, that's basically what we've been doing. We've been working on this in zebrafish. Um, and the idea is to basically target a bunch of different genes and see if we can get lethal overexpression. We, um, we inject uh, uh, zebrafish zygotes uh, in the egg stage with a, a construct that creates, that has that programmable gene activator and targets a range of different genes. Um, and then we monitor the survival rate of those zebrafish over the next seven days, which is what this graph represents here, the survival from 100% down to zero, and over the course of zero to seven days. Um, it's important in these experiments to have a control, and that's what this um, bright teal aqua colour here is here. Um, you can see, actually, you still get quite a lot of death just from the control, just because of the, the process of um, injecting these eggs is not um, all that uh, great for the survival of the eggs. Um, but the important ones are here down below. There's a lot of different genes here that didn't work. As I said, it's, it's a hit and miss, really, as to whether you get a good gene that works. 
Um, you can see these genes here, the green and the orange one, have a really high level of death compared to the control. Um, the orange one in particular, nearly, nearly everything dies. And I'll just point out as well that um, this is uh, an underrepresentation of the lethality because when we make transgenic fish in um, this case here, um, those transgenes don't necessarily integrate into every cell um, and they don't also always express well in all the cells as well. So um, really we're seeing like the sort of minimum amount of lethality that these genes would really cause. Um, so the other important thing in this system here is obviously we targeting this gene to cause that lethal overstression, but we also want to be able to protect against that by mutating this um, this bit in front of the in front of the gene here, so that this fish doesn't just kill itself by overexpressing its own genes. Um, so essentially, we, we repeat the same experiments again, um, and this is the, the same data from that that orange line before and the the teal line as the control there. Um, but this time, instead of just injecting um, the same things, um, we, we inject as well, something as well, that will mutate this promoter back up here. Um, and that's what this dashed line does here. Um, you can see that, yeah, it's basically um, rescuing perfectly this, um, this mutation here. It's the same um, amount of survival as we're seeing in the negative control. Um, and we've also sequenced those target sites to make sure it's actually, actually working correctly. So basically, yeah, we're, we're at the stage where we've made this fish here um, and it seems like all the components are working well and it's just like the final test you need, really need to do is to um, uh, cross it to a wild fish and, and, and see how it goes there. Um, uh, I should mention as well that this is like an, a, a, basically established technology at this point in um, both yeast and um, fruit flies where it's shown to be like 100% effective essentially at keeping um, the barrier up between the two species to cause lethality. So I'll just summarise um, what I've talked about, and it's just really that the, the modelling tells us that SIMS is like a really solid strategy for suppression of um, European carp, um, and this engineered genetic infidelity, which is one of the vital components of SIMS, works exceptionally well in fruit flies, and the, and the data we've got in zebrafish at the moment also shows that we've got like highly lethal targets for it, and that lethality can be efficiently protected against by mutating those target sites. Um, so yeah, the next step is just basically finish that testing off um, and combine with a, a female lethal system as well. Um, and at that point we can like translate it over into Euro European carp and um, we've actually already got like facilities in place in, with our collaborators in the University of Minnesota to, to get that off the ground. So yeah, that's the end of my talk. I'd just like to thank the other members of my, my lab and the, my collaborators at the um, University of Minnesota and CSIRO. And, Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Chandran. Trojan fish. Wow. This, this um, moving through our 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 kind of tour of technologies that are emerging and um, looking like they're they're uh, potentially applicable. We'll move to the next technology. I'm filling while everyone sits. I'll move to the next technology. So Professor Paul Thomas from um, University of Adelaide leads the Gene ed Genome Editing Laboratory. Jen. Um, director of the South Australian Genome Editing Facility. So over to you, Paul. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks indeed. Thanks to the organisers for the opportunity to present today. So I'm really a molecular biologist and biomedical researcher and I've been working on mouse models for human diseases for 25, 30 years or so. But the technology that we were using in that context can also be transferred over into potentially pest control biotechnologies. So that's what I'm going to tell you about today, some work that's been going on over the last, I guess, five years or so in an effort to try and come up with solutions for genetic biocontrol, specifically gene drive type solutions for invasive rodents. So, you know, what is a gene drive? We've heard this term a few times today. No one's really defined it. And actually, they come in many flavours, as I'll, as I'll tell you about. But this is uh, really what a gene drive is in essence. It's a, it's a genetic construct. It can be natural or it can be synthetic. But it has the ability to, if you like, uh, cheat the rules of, of normal genetics. It can spread through a population by virtue of the fact that it gets transmitted to the next generation at greater than 50% frequency. 
So if we were to make a transgenic, so we would just to insert a, a gene into an organism, say a mouse, we'll just call it TG, so this is a transgenic organism, this would not, this could be passed on to the next generation, of course, but beyond that, it would only be passed on to 50% of the progeny, therefore, it would not spread through the population and would actually probably be lost due to um, some sort of fitness effect. But in contrast, a gene drive has this ability to spread through a population. And this can be used to either modify or even suppress a population, even to cause eradication. Um, at least that's what the modelling is telling us. So I'm going to tell you about, I guess, our efforts to try and generate different types of gene drives in rodents and perhaps um, the potential to translate those technologies over into other invasive species, particularly mammals right at the end. Okay, so, you know, why do we want to develop gene drives? Well, we've had a lot on that here today, of course, but just to focus on mice specifically, because that's sort of where we're coming from. On islands, uh, invasive rodents cause huge destruction and <coughs> ecological um, damage uh, and impact nesting sites for birds which are often using those islands as, as migratory breeding sites. Um, and there are many examples of species lost on islands due to the infestation of rodents, mice and rats. And of course, in the context of Australia, we have plagues every four years or so. And I was really interested in Gerald's talk. I'd like to talk to you later on actually about the impact of, of mice on farms, perhaps in a more um, persistent fashion rather than just in the context of plagues. But clearly they're a big issue. They cause enormous amount of damage, agricultural loss, as well as the impact on the mental health of those that have to live through them. So that's why we want to work on rodents in terms of gene drive. This first technology I'll tell you about uh, at the start of the talk, uh, the first gene drive example really has been driven a lot by what's happening in the case of malaria control. These kinds of technologies have been developed to the greatest extent in, in mosquitoes. Um, in the context of malaria control particularly, but also other vector-borne diseases carried by mosquito species. Okay, so as I said, gene drives actually come in different flavours. The one I'm going to tell you about that really got the field excited maybe five to eight years ago was this so-called CRISPR homing drive. I'll tell you how that works in a minute. We've tried to work this one up in mice. I'll tell you how that went. Um, we're also working on something called an X-shredder or driving Y. This is a kind of strategy to make the population completely male, cause a crash through sex biasing. But really, I think the, um, the most promising story that I'll tell you about today is the one I'll, I'll, I'll tell you about last, which is a, a new form of gene drive that we've generated that's showing some promise in the modelling as well as being engineered in laboratory mice. So I'll come to that right at the end. All of these technologies, and Chan just touched on this in his talk, have really become practically possible through the, emerg through the emergence of so-called CRISPR-Cas9 genome editing. I'm not going to dwell on that anymore today, except to say it's basically a pair of molecular scissors that we can go into the genome and use it to um, uh, inactivate genes, as well as make the transgenic organisms that we need to to create these gene drive species in virtually any, in any species. Okay, so how does, it, how does a gene drive work? I don't want to get too technical and sort of get too much into the weeds, but um, I think it's important just to understand how these things can work. Um, and as I said, this is really working quite well in species of mosquitoes. So basically a gene drive in this context, the homing drive, um, is a, an elegant design whereby you've got the CRISPR machinery integrated onto a chromosome. And that chromosome site is also the site that's targeted by the um, CRISPR machinery. So what I mean by that is that here's a gene drive organism. It's got two versions of this gene drive, one on each chromosome. It meets a wild-type mouse, therefore we've got a wild-type chromosome and a gene drive coming together. And what happens with the gene drive in the germline, so basically the sperm, developing eggs and sperm, is that the gene drive gets active and it cuts the wild-type chromosome here and through a process called homing, copies itself on to repair that double-stranded break. And that enables the same mouse to be created that you've got here at the start of the process. So in other words, we're going to get a spread through a population because we're always transmitting that construct. That's the good news. The bad news is that sometimes this goes wrong and you get a different repair mechanism uh, occurring and this is, um, generates a little mutation at that site and that's no longer able to receive the gene drive and therefore it becomes a resistance allele. So the big enemy of gene drive spread are these so-called resistance alleles that emerge as part of this process or can be present within the population already. So it's important to realise, and I think we've had this point earlier, that gene drives are, are not necessarily a silver bullet. They're not a silver bullet because there will be mechanisms that will resist their spread through a population. It's always going to be this um, way of, uh, this arms race between the emergence of resistance alleles and the gene drive itself. Now the 
good news to some extent is that they're working amazing, amazingly well in insects, um, and it was really prompted by this paper to start with in Drosophila, but then has been taken further in, in um, Anopheles mosquitoes, to the point where we're now getting examples of homing rates, so that the process whereby the gene drive replicates is occurring around 99% of the time. So really quite amazing spread through populations. And they've got to the point now where they're testing in these quite large cage trials. Um, one of their sort of uh, lead gene drive designs, which is actually showing really good efficacy in that, in that context. So this conversation around gene drive deployment is probably the most advanced in terms of malaria control um, by groups, particularly in the UK, talking now um, with groups in Africa about, and, and governments in Africa about the um, regulation and so on and, and stakeholder engagement about you know, the appetite for this particular form of, of control. So really interesting time. Now, does it work in rodents, of course? So we were interested to try and understand that. So we did quite a lot of work, and Chan, who just spoke uh, um, previously, before he started working on fish, um, we managed to get him working in, in rodents. Um, so you could say he cut his teeth in rodents. But we tried to um, get gene drives working in mice when we really, we just could not get it working um, to a detectable level. That's kind of been found in other studies as well. It's interesting, though, there's, there's a paper in, um, came, in, came out in Nature that's showing that it could work in females, or at least that homing reaction could work in females. It wasn't a sort of typical gene drive that we could use in the field or potentially use for biocontrol. So that was kind of encouraging. Uh, second paper, though, sort of indicated that, mm, yeah, pretty difficult to get anything done with that kind of homing rate. This most latest paper only dropped this week, so you're now completely up to date with... Um, the field in terms of rodents. Actually, the, the mouse is still proving too difficult, I would say, from this paper as well. But there's some evidence that in rats, at least, the homing rates, that self-replication event that occurs in the germline, is actually working a bit higher than be expected, 67% as a maximum in this paper. So kind of interesting. So I would kind of shelved this approach as not being useful in rodents. Perhaps it might be. We're going to look at this with some modelling um, using the techniques that Ashikov will tell, tell you about in the next um, session. All right, so for the rest of the talk, I'll focus on this so-called T-CRISPR. So the homing mechanism is part of that replication process that we need for gene drive spread. And if we can't get that to work, then we needed to think about other ways to get a gene drive to spread through a population. So we turn to this so-called T-haplotype, which is a naturally occurring gene drive in mammals, and, and specifically in mice. And it kind of works like this. So this is just a variant of chromosome 17, so it's just something that's normally present within a population. And this um, variation on chromosome 17 has two essential components to it. Um, as what happens during sperm development, when all the sperm actually they are sort of linked together with these bridges, the variant on chromosome 17 produces a toxin and an antidote. The toxin spreads through all of the sperm and it inhibits their motility, but those sperm that contain this so-called T-haplotype sequence also contain an antidote, which doesn't spread. So only these sperm get the, the antidote. And what that means is that the, these sperm are compromised in terms of their motility, and these are not. Therefore, it's the red sperm that gets the egg first, and therefore you get transmission bias based on that um, ability of these sperm to swim better than these. So this occurs naturally, as I said, in the wild. We've known about this mechanism for a while, and we kind of thought to ourselves, can we leverage it to produce a gene drive that could cause female infertility. So how would that work? And again, I don't want to get too technical with this stuff, but just to really show you how the thought process by which we came up with this idea and then to show you if it works or not. So here's the T haplotype region that I just showed you. Uh, we've now modified it so that it also contains an additional genetic element. So this is a GMO now. It's gone from a non-GMO to a GMO. And that genetic element that we've introduced inactivates a female fertility gene that's present. And this has no effect in males, and it has no effect, no effect in females until they inherit that from both of their parents. So the idea here is to spread this female infertility trait through the population using this drive, and then to get a crash in the population due to too much female infertility genes being present, saturating the population, if you will. So could it work? And if so, can we engineer it? So this is some modelling that, as I said, Ashigal, who will tell you about the details of this in the next session. You're looking at an island. 
Uh, it's got 200,000 mice, and we've introduced the red gene drive T-CRISPR component onto the island. And you can see it spreads quite nicely through the population. And once it reaches that saturation kind of level, the fact we've got female infertility genes being knocked out as part of this spread, you can see we get a gradual loss in the amount of mice in the population. It takes quite a long time. It's about a 20-year time frame, but the, if you like, the ecological benefit starts after about 10 years. And with this particular simulation, uh, we've introduced 256 mice into a 200,000 mouse population. So we were quite inspired by that. Um, Modelling's great, but can we actually engineer the mouse? Uh, you know, it's a, that's, a, that's another question. So I'm going to tell you and finish off with the fact that we have and just show you a little bit of data from that study, which is close to being published now. We needed to import this T. haplotype mouse from the US during the pandemic, and that <laughs> took, took a long time, almost as long as actually doing the experiment. Um, but we engineered it so that it now contained one component of the gene drive, which is this so-called guide RNA. So CRISPR comes in two parts, and this is one part here. And we'd split the drive up into two parts, partly because of safety reasons. We didn't want to, if you like, engineer the uh, end game version of the drive in the lab. Um, but rather split it up into two components so that if there was an unintentional release, we wouldn't have any impact on the environment due to that. So we've got one part uh, in, the, in the T haplotype, this is the guide RNA, and we engineered a separate line to express the other part, which is the, the Cas9 protein that cuts the DNA, and that's shown here with this green fluorescent protein. So we've got this green fluorescence that we also heard about earlier from Ella uh, in the talk, and you can see this is a section through a testes, and you can see that the gene's active. Okay, so now when we cross these two mice together, we get the, um, um, everything within the single male, shown here, every, uh, both components of the gene drive, and it should be active. So in other words, when we have these mice, we should be able to look at the offspring and see whether they've got the features that we would predict that they would have. And that would be mutations in the target female gene, which is occurring. Um, so we get a uh, knockout of the female gene in 80% of them. We have normal litter size. The T CRISPR transmission is unaltered, which is what we would expect, still 95% and no activity in females. So this has given us proof of concept in an experimental model system, mouse, um, for the T CRISPR. So if you want to learn more about it, um, of course I'm happy to chat, but um, there's the, uh, the preprint, um, which as I said, we hope will be published soon. But the take home point really is that we've now got some, um, we have a proof of concept for a, a new drive, T CRISPR, which seems to be robust from the modeling it's feasible in terms of making the transgenic animal and we're getting the um, outcomes in an experimental setting that we were hoping for as part of this um, system development. So now um, we want to engineer it further to look at population specific T CRISPR. Obviously we're doing stakeholder and regulatory engagement as part of this process as well and we'd like to transfer the technology into other species as well using the components, particularly rats. And with that, I'll finish and just thank the people who were involved in the work. And specifically, I just want to point out, particularly Luke down the front here is the PhD student who's done a lot of the mouse work that I've talked about. And I just learned this morning that this guy up here, Fatwa Adekazuma, got himself an ARC DECRA fellowship. So that came up in the last step. So just telling you that as well. Okay, thanks very much. How interesting. It, it, it's, um, there's a pattern, particularly in these, these particular, Chandra and, and, and Paul, there's this pattern of this long years of detective work of trying it in a new, um, in a new model and, and taking it. The other, the other interesting um, pattern I, I took out of both those task talks is, is the technology transfer. Is, okay, it doesn't work in that species. We'll pick it up and we'll try it in this species. Okay, it we, we, we works there. We'll pick it up and try it there. That's really interesting. And I also, now we all have a new enemy. And that is resistance alleles. So we all we're going to get stickers. I hate resistance alleles. That's the new. That'll be the the merch coming out of this one, Mike. Okay. So um, you get the T-shirt. I hate resistance alleles. So we're going to move to our, our last speaker before we have our, our um, one of the organisers of the event. One of the, put, put the hard yards in the background, but I, so I'm going to give you some credit for this, Stephen. You and Alan. Um, so um, Stephen Frankenberg from the University of Melbourne. Um, is, a, is a research associate and leader of the PIPA, which is Pipelines for Invasive Pest Eradication Research. Everyone's got to have an acronym. Mm. It's brilliant. Yep, it's very witty. Thank, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, 
So yeah, there you go. That's that's my lab there. Um, Piper Lab. It's a fairly new, uh, rapidly expanding lab uh, with that uh, witty acronym. Um, and I'm gonna. Uh, well, first of all, I'll uh, also want to uh, do the usual acknowledgement of uh, First Nations peoples, and also apologise to them for the uh, introduction of all of these uh, invasive species um, over the past couple of hundred years as well. So I'm going to tell you a bit about the work we're doing um, on the development of um, pipelines for. Um, developing these genetic biocontrols. Paul's already given you a, um, a bit of an overview of what a gene drive is. So I'll throw, throw this in just in case to remind you uh, that uh, a gene drive basically biases uh, inheritance of uh, an allele so that eventually, ideally, uh, the whole population uh, inherits it. Um, and so the, um, the, the other possibility that, that a gene drive can be used for uh, is to, uh, if you target a female fertility gene, um, then you um, have the capacity of, uh, of um, essentially um, causing all of the uh, males in the, or, or all the females to be uh, infertile and you end up with only a population of males, uh, which obviously for, um, from the point of view of animal uh, welfare is, is a you know, fantastic potential solution for uh, eradicating a population. Um, and so um, the success of being able to do this, uh, or these are sort of the main things that I've sort of focused on in, in, in our lab uh, for, for our long-term goals with this, is that we need firstly to um, achieve efficient gene drive design. And as you've seen from Paul, that's a, obviously a very sort of intensive field of uh, research. And the other thing is uh, simply to be able to produce these animals in the first place that carry the gene drive. So um, Paul is lucky enough that he works on, on rodents and mice specifically, where, where there are a lot of uh, the, the methods for uh, generating uh, knock-ins um, of large um, DNA fragments specifically to a precise location in the, in the genome has been de um, refined quite well over uh, the past decades. But to do this in all of these other uh, species uh, that, are, that are invasive pests uh, is a lot more problematic. So to begin with, uh, for, a, first, uh, for a, a good gene drive design, we need, um, first of all, we need suitable target genes that are essential to female development or fertility. So it can either stop them turning into females in the first place, or, or if they do, then they're infertile. And um, fortunately, well, there are not many candidates for these sort of genes because they need to be genes that are, um, that are essential in, in females but have zero role at all in males. And they're, there are, there's a small number of them, but, um, but I would say that there are enough for us to be able to uh, utilise in the development of gene, uh, gene drives. So, for example, um, as Ellen mentioned earlier, um, the zone of pellucida is a sort of a, a jelly-like coat that surrounds uh, the egg, and that's quite a good candidate for the, there's a particular genes and uh, one gene in particular, which is essential for the production of the zone of pellucida. So, if we target that, then it, it should be a good target. Um, and the other thing is uh, efficient, achieving efficient copying of the gene drive in the cell. So uh, specifically, that's in the um, spermatocytes, which are the, the cells that develop into sperm. And the reasons why that sort of stage of development is, is, in, is targeted, uh, I'll explain in a bit. So Paul mentioned uh, a little bit about how a, uh, a gene drive is uh, transmitted. And um, uh, so, first of all, uh, the, the key um, uh, enzyme that's important for that is, is Cas9, and uh, the, the, the coding sequence, the, uh, the Cas9 gene itself, is actually incorporated into the uh, gene drive uh, module, or cassette, uh, as well as the, the guide RNA, which is the, has a, 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 like a designed sequence which specifically target, targets it to the, uh, to the target gene, so in this case, uh, a female fertility gene. And, uh, and then we also have this um, promoter, this, this regulatory sequence of DNA that tells, that basically instructs when uh, this Cas9 um, gene is being expressed and producing the Cas9 enzyme. So the timing of the expression and, and what the level of expression is and uh, in which cells. So we need this Cas9 to be, uh, to be switched on as determined by this promoter uh, in, uh, in the spermatocytes. So, then what happens, as Paul explained, uh, uh, once the DNA is cut by the, uh, by the Cas9 enzyme, uh, then there are two possible outcomes. The, the outcome we want is where uh, the, the cut site um, uh, is repaired by basically a copying across um, because of these crossovers that occur between the, um, the chromosomes that creates a second copy of the, of the gene drive and that's how it spreads through the population. The other result that we don't want is this other alternative uh, DNA repair pathway that's naturally occurs in cells, which is NHA 
in an NHEJ pathway, uh, and that can result in that uh, gene drive resistant allele, which we hate so much. Um, so we need to have um, uh, promoters that, um, that, uh, expressed ex uh, that control the expression of Cas9 in exactly the right way so that we achieve that HDR pathway and not the NHEJ pathway. So, um, so Paul mentioned uh, this, there was a recent paper here that, that, um, that achieved an overall 5% efficiency of the actual cutting. So, that, so mostly that's attributable, attributable to the actual low level of the Cas9 expression by that promoter. The actual sort of the timing of the expression uh, of using that promoter that they used in that paper uh, publication, um, actually the gene conversion rate was actually pretty good, the copying rate. But overall, the, the, um, which is good news, but overall that 5% efficiency is obviously not adequate with that promoter. So um, uh, one of the main goals in, in my lab is to, to identify alternative promoters that can, uh, can achieve this. Um, so we need to identify promoters that, uh, that, have, uh, that uh, switch on Cas9 expression both at a high level and during this early meiosis uh, phase of uh, sperm development. So if, uh, anyone who um, is not a biologist or might remember from high school biology, uh, meiosis is basically the early stage of uh, formation of, of sperm and eggs when we get all that sort of recombination crossing over uh, of our uh, genes that we've inherited from each of our parents into a sort of a new combination, which is why you know, we, um, we look different to our own siblings, uh, etc. And it's those crossovers that are cap happening during that stage of sperm development here that are actually the mechanism that cause that copying of the, of the gene drive. That, and we want to sort of focus uh, the Cas9 expression to that time because we're basically exploiting that natural mechanism in, uh, in, the, sperm, in the spermatocytes. So in order to uh, do this, we're using uh, zebrafish as our, as our lab model. So it's our, basically our, um, our sort of laboratory vertebrate, in a sense, that represents all vertebrates. And, um, and we've set up, uh, so similar to what uh, Paul mentioned, uh, we've, we've created a split gene drive, which is where we've separated the components of the, of the gene drive into two parts of the, chromosome, of the genome as a biosecurity thing. So, you know, the zebrafish, the, if they get back to the... Um, India or uh, wherever they're from uh, and uh, sort of into the wild population that they won't wipe out that population. Um, and so as a, as a proof of principle, uh, the, we're, um, we've targeted this uh, gene CYP19A1A which encodes uh, the enzyme aromatase which is the enzyme that converts uh, testosterone to estrogen. So this is, in the context of fish, this is a, a gene which is basically essential for female development. So this is our proof of uh, principle in, in, uh, in um, uh, knocking out fertility in the female. And this work is, uh, is in collaboration with um, Dr. Patricia, Patricia Youssef at Melbourne Uni and, uh, and uh, our PhD student, Clancy Lawler, who's, who's doing these experiments. So, um, so this is the first part of this sort of split gene drive where we've knocked in uh, this, this construct into uh, the CYP19A1A gene. And so it includes just the guide RNA that targets that to the wild type version of, of uh, the aromatase gene. And it also has this uh, red fluorescent protein um, uh, sort of reporter uh, that you can see um, lighting up here on the right, uh, which this is just a, a zebrafish embryo that's showing that we've successfully uh, targeted using CRISPR, knocked that into the uh, aromatase gene. And then uh, the second part of it is, uh, is, uh, is, not, is, is sort of uh, inserted into the genome elsewhere, uh, which contains the actual Cas9 gene and um, uh, spermatocyte-specific promoter that we're testing. So this is basically setting up a system where we can just screen uh, dozens or hundreds, if necessary, of different spermatocyte promoters so we can find the absolute best one that, uh, that promotes, uh, at the same time, both the uh, efficient cutting of, uh, of the DNA by Cas9 as, as well as the copying um, by being very precise in the timing of uh, that spermatocyte uh, development. Uh, now, the other kind of um, parallel side to what we're doing in, uh, in our lab is, um, is just developing the pipelines for getting large uh, DNA constructs into, uh, precisely into fertility genes, which is straightforward in, in mice, but not so straightforward in uh, other non-model species. So to do this, we're doing it because we haven't designed the optimal uh, gene drive uh, design yet. We're sort of doing it in two steps. We, we kind of do the hard part first, uh, just to get in a fragment that contains these, uh, these what are called lock sites, where it's a little specific sequence. 
uh, that once we've got those into the fertility gene, uh, then we can use those sites to really uh, easily sort of swap out whatever we've put in and put in a, a much larger fragment. So in the future, that'd be a gene drive construct, and that's a, that would be a very easy step to do once we've got those lock sites in there already. Um, and so to do this, uh, we've, there's a number of um, invasive pest species which we, um, which we are working on in the lab. Uh, and so we have uh, European carp and cane toad, uh, as well as uh, fox and uh, rabbit. And so, um, so our locks insertion strategies for, f firstly, for these uh, top two species, we're using just uh, simply direct micro-injection of our CRISPR reagents into um, thousands of eggs because these species just lay thousands of eggs at a time. So you can use this strategy, which you can't really use so practically with, uh, with uh, mammals. And you can, you can grow those up uh, e uh, easily up to an early stage of development to check that you've got the, the, that knock-in correctly using the CRISPR. Uh, not so easy for mammals. Uh, for mammals, the, the strategy we're, um, we're establishing in the lab is uh, instead to use uh, cultured cells first. So these are not um, uh, necessarily embryonic stem cells as that you can use in mice for using different methods to sort of produce animals from. But... Uh, but using those cells to then uh, use the method of nuclear transfer, where we take the nucleus containing the chromosomes of those cells and insert them into uh, an oocyte, an egg uh, of an animal that's had its genome sort of taken out first and then replaced with the chromosomes from those cells that we've CRISPR edited to put our lock sites into. So nuclear transfer is simply the, that's the same method that was used uh, a couple of decades ago to produce Dolly the sheep, um, which was produced from a, a basically a cell culture. The, uh, the nuclei of those cells uh, were used in, uh, to put into an oocyte to basically produce a clone uh, of, of the animal that those cells were originally uh, derived from. So to put that, that whole sort of pipeline uh, into the context of, for example, uh, um, uh, producing foxes that have these lock sites uh, inserted uh, into the cells that we can then replace with a gene drive uh, further down the track. So we have uh, uh, cultured cells. Um, you can see some of them we have growing in the lab here. And the idea is we, we can do our CRISPR editing, put in the LOX uh, site. We can either do that directly with these, uh, just the somatic cells that are derived uh, from the FOX, or we can reprogram the cells first into these sort of IPS cells, which are basically uh, an early embryonic stem cell kind of type cell that we predict will work much more efficiently for this uh, process of nuclear transfer uh, further down the track. So we can use oocytes, um, then that we've taken out the, the nucleus, the chromosomes from the oocyte, um, either from a, from a fox ovary or potentially even using dog ovaries from vet clinics that have been desexed, and then doing the nuclear transfer and um, producing embryos and then we can cryopreserve them uh, for later use. And uh, finally, on the topics of, uh, topic of caveats, since uh, it's a good segue into the next um, um, uh, session, uh, so um, uh, Paul mentioned gene drive resistance. So th there is a solution that we could possibly use to overcome that. Um, and that's simply, uh, it's a similar concept to what Ellen mentioned you, uh, earlier about two-factor authentication. You can, uh, if you insert sort of uh, uh, half a dozen or so different guide RNAs, so that would be six or seven factor authentication, uh, then basically that reduces the probability of that um, resistance allele, because there's always going to be one that hasn't mutated uh, or doesn't have natural resistance uh, at that site, um, that, that the gene drive is still going to be able to recognise that wild type. And uh, another um, often sort of, um, sort of addressed uh, caveat uh, to, to this is the risk of introduction to a non-target population. So, for example, if cane toads were to hitch a ride uh, to back to South America, where they came from, uh, the, the main sort of thing to highlight is that it would actually be easier to engineer a gene drive resistant to allele um, while maintaining its functionality than it is to engineer the gene drive in the first place. And that, having that, uh, being able to introduce that uh, resistant allele back into a population you want to preserve uh, actually gives it that protect protection against um, um, the gene drive. And I'd just like to thank uh, yeah, my lab members uh, and other collaborators at uh, Melbourne University uh, as well and my funders uh, and uh, other supporters including Matt Rothwell and um, also Hunters as, as well who have helped me. Thank you. I'm, I'm really struck, just all you guys are coming up, I'm really struck by the, um, the genetic kill switches, that, you know, these, these split gene drives, these things that you're building in for, to about those, un, you know... Uh, safety, safety. Safety, yeah, exactly. <laughs> safety switches, I guess, is the, is the best word to use. We might start with... You've got no, we're in 
In the room, we're in the room. We're starting in the room. If anyone has a question, we've got a bunch of questions. We'll go down. I, I wonder, is there a possibility of using, um, t targeting a gene that controls implantation rather than the germline? Because after, after all, the implantation um, time in human pregnancy is one of the critical ones. So is actually targeting a gene that is involved, critical for implantation, just as successful as the germline? Yeah, I could tell you that. Yeah, there are likely to be um, plenty uh, identifying ones that, um, so a lot of genes that even if they're involved in, in things like implantation, they have some other role in the male as well, in some other sort of um, tissue organ. And so it is. it can be challenging to identify ones that only have a role um, in females. Um, it's, but, and also, I, I mean, the ones we're focusing mostly on with what we're doing is ones that, that are genes that are very highly conserved during evolution, where, where we can be pretty confident that, it, that in every species, every invasive species, um, that it's gonna have that critical role. And in the case of implantation, because every species kind of varies in, in its type of implantation, the kind of placenta it forms and all these sort of things, We'd, we'd be sort of putting a lot of effort in, into figuring it out for one species and then it may not be for another species. So you're right, but in terms of the long-term um, efficiency of this whole pipeline, I'm um, yeah, trying to focus on ones that are, that are you know, universal for all species. Mm. Thank you. We're gonna, we're gonna go online, the questions online. Um, we have a question from Hannah that I might uh, alter slightly. Um, so just wondering about your collaboration with other countries, particularly island, island nations like ours and New Zealand, so Aotearoa, hopefully I pronounced that correct, correctly, um, and their predator-free New Zealand research has had successes as well. So what's your collaboration or what, what are we learning from what other countries are doing? We might actually take something from each of the, um, the... We'll start with you, Paul. You look like you're ready to go. And then we'll jump to you, Transit. And then... I can take that one for starters. Yeah. Um, so I guess I didn't have time to mention it, but it did come up earlier in um, one of the talks. I can't remember who it was, but um, I think it might have been Andreas's talk about G-Bird. Um, uh, is a consortium based in with Australian researchers, New Zealand researchers, um, and US researchers at the moment, it's always expanding. So the idea of that is really to bring skills from those different countries uh, to bear on this common problem we have of invasive rodents. So there's, that side of it is very much alive and well in terms of the uh, concerted effort and collaboration that we've been hearing about earlier today. Um, and there are specific uh, research collaborations going on between you know, some of the research groups with other overseas groups, that maybe through co-funding those, those um, and I know, of course, Predator Free 2050, um, and we'll hear from Dan Tompkins, I think, mm. later in the day. Yep. So those, those links are very much alive and well, and we're looking to all move in the same direction in terms of getting the job done and building some of these technologies. And in fact, the, uh, the first speaker after, after lunch will be Dan. Yep. Um, Chandra, do you want to, just before we jump onto the next question, do you want to continue the Yeah, I just, um, more like commenting really on like the, the, um, the technical aspects or like the capability to do certain work, like, because we've got collaborators in um, uh, in the US and uh, they basically have large fish facilities set up already for um, growing carp and basically allowing them to, like, spawn at any point during the year, which is a hard thing to do, um, to to test this kind of thing. Because, like, that, that kind of stuff takes a lot of time and effort to get up and going and to have large facilities for, um, like, um, rearing the the carp as well. I think just being able to just like collaborate out and sort of parcel out the research to different different groups and things like that and sort of learn from each other and then yeah, sort of build what we want to get to in the end. And can I just, just to clarify too, the large facilities, is that both for the volume of fish that you want to produce, but also the fact that these need to be biosecure and contained, yeah. and so you've got a very specialised large fish facility. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Right? And that would be the same with any other on, you know, terrestrial species as well. You'd need to build and maintain these things that are biosecure and big. Yeah, Paul. yeah. I know there's a similar thing at uh, Fort Collins in the US, uh, the USDA facility. They have these so-called simulated natural environment rooms for rodents that can house rodents, and you can do trials in those environments. Um, and you can make it rain, you can do all sorts of stuff. So you can really build in environmental components to it. So I, I mentioned that, but also I think, um, like, um, uh, KISS is important in this regard as well because this gives us, you know, that 
connection not only within Australia to collaborate, but also to make those connections overseas as well. So having a national um, invasive species centre um, kind of keeps the whole ship moving in the right direction. Like greases the wheels of the collaboration. There's a question up there. Or, or Steve, did you want to add to the collaboration uh, question? Um, no, well, more the New Zealand thing. I mean, I was. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I mean, at the moment, New Zealand is not sort of um, throwing lots of money at the genetic biocontrol, but um, and I'm not. It, it, there may be sort of end up being some differences between Australia and New Zealand in terms of how quickly we you know we approach this, and, and, and which is why. Having a lot of, I, I like. I think the public sort of perception of this sort of thing um, is is a really important factor, uh, and um, is why these sort of events, <laughs> I think, are, are, are really important for for um, doing that. But I think in the longer term, um, New Zealand will probably, uh, I would expect, would eventually um, sort of embrace this sort of technology as well, and that there would be a lot more sort of uh, collaboration um, in the future uh, on this as well. I think. Thank you. Uh, up the back of the room. Hi. Um, being aware that um, in vertebrate biology, most embryos start female, essentially, and that widespread plastic contamination, mostly, has led to endocrine disruptors in the environment, particularly the aquatic environment, and these have estrogen-like effects. What is the likelihood of that impacting the male bias technologies for particularly aquatic control? Gosh, what an interesting question. Who yeah. wants to pick that one up? That is such a great connection of different... <laughs> yeah. Um, it's gonna, I think it's going to depend on specifically what you're targeting to make the male bias. Um, like just, just in zebrafish, for example, um, which doesn't translate it over exactly, like you've got genes where you can actually um, just knock out a gene and which everything will just be male like there's there's no female at all um just due to the basically lack of like cell death when it converts from nothing to a male or female um but yeah it i think you're just gonna have to choose your genes carefully and test them and potentially also test them in contaminated well contaminated water supplies to see if that actually has an effect on their on their sex as well do you want to oh, so yeah, I was simply, simply going to say, yeah. I mean, the case of in the case of sex determination in, in fish, there is a lot of plasticity in sex determination that you can sort of swing it both ways. But that's in the sort of more in the context of everything else being normal uh, genetically. But uh, but in terms of not, I mean, there are certain genes that you can just simply, if you knock out that gene, it doesn't matter about all that extra plastic, plasticity. If you knock out aromatase, they're not going to develop as as females. Mm. And so I think there's that. It's, yeah, it, it shouldn't be a problem in that context. Yeah. Um, we'll take one more question online and then we're going to break for lunch. <laughs> I know we've already discussed this sort of with, with the previous speakers, but for a genetics kind of point of view, um, do you sort of see that there might be public resistance to implementing things like gene drives and, and um, how, how might we be able to overcome these barriers? What a brilliant segue to the session after lunch too, <laughs> but yeah. Who wants to pick uh, this up? Then? Uh, well, yeah, I mean, you guys think about this a lot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. um, um, yeah. So, well, certainly, you know, something like cats or whatever. I mean, I mean, it, obviously, people are going to get upset about the idea of um, you know cats in the environment that are genetically modified and um, and yeah. Whereas, obviously, for, you know, from, well, from my point of view, nobody should be allowing their cats to mate with feral cats anyway uh any, obviously any you know um, cat breeders would not be anyway let allowing their cats and so i mean it tends to be you know, in my mind fairly easy to, to sort of defend all of those arguments that's not to say that of course people are not going <laughs> to um, um, express their um sort of protests about that sort of thing but again that's that's the sort of thing where it just you need to have as much um conversation about it as possible uh to make people as as you know as understanding of, of the facts uh, about it all as possible. Um, that's the most important thing. Paul, did you want to build yeah, on I that? Think, yeah, I think I, I broadly agree. We had some really good answers to this question before. And um, I think the key to it is early and respectful engagement with the community, all members of the community. Um, and there'll be a whole range of views out there, of course. I think the last thing we want to do is have this technology <laughs> at a late stage become on the community's radar. <clears throat> uh, that That is not the way we want to go for this. So. 
I also think it's incumbent upon us to um, get ourselves out there, even if we may not enjoy doing media interviews, and I'm one of those, um, but it's really it's our responsibility to bring the information to the public um, and start the conversation, because unless we start that conversation early, it's, it's, it really may not be um, good for the technology and the outcome in the long term, but also I think we have to face the fact that we might get to a point where community views mean that we don't roll out the technology <clears throat> and we have to be prepared for that uh, as scientists involved in the field as well. So. I just kind of want to, Tanya wants to make, Tanya wants to make a quick comment. Thank you. It's, it's actually more of a comment to um, the previous question. So um, CSRO has just published a, a report on the public perceptions of the theoretical ability of gene drive technology and they actually chose the feral cat as the example. So that report is published and available and we can put the, the link to it up in, in, in a slide in, in a forward session. And the outcome was quite astounding. Um, on balance, the, uh, ex the, 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 accept the level of acceptance in Australia appears to be quite high. So you get, you get a normal distribution. Most people are actually mildly or slightly more strongly in favour. And then at the extreme end, you get the feral cat haters. Um, so the, the general level of, of public acceptance is um, compared to other places in the world to these approaches quite high, provided everyone said, you know, it can be demonstrated that it is safe and effective. When you say quite high, I just want to just check, is that 51% or is it 90%? You know, just to, you know, just in that sense of uh, I don't want to quote you on the numbers, to but describe. just... describe, so the, the responses were broken down into, I'm completely against this, a little bit against it, no. I don't care, slightly in favour, strongly in favour, oh. and, and it was, um, the, the breakdown was, it was pretty much a, a, a normal distribution that yeah. was slightly skewed to the right. So the majority of respondents were either didn't care or were mildly in favour. Yep. And then there was a peak towards the I'm extremely in favour of this end. And those, I suppose, were the feral cat we'll try and get We'll try and get a link to, and get that um, into the online chat. And it, final comment before... And so then I we'll just break wanted for to lunch. hear from um, Rob Day. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. Hi, so I'm, I'm impressed by the um, strategy and the, and the long-term thinking of all these um, things and, and the technology that's involved. But it strikes me that all of these things are really well designed for um, invasive species which have become established already and we have, we know the problem, we know the species and so on. Um, but this way of doing things, this long sort of process of developing a good technology is not going to work well for something such as a, a spiny uh, Indonesian toad that suddenly arrives where you need something to, to be done early because doing something early will be much better than doing something later. And so I'm interested to, to hear about whether there are people who have been developing things for, you know, what you can do once you have a vertebrate that is a pest that you need to knock out quickly. So, yeah, I'll get, yeah, I can address that. Yeah. So um, good you raised that because I'm actually in our lab. We've started a little pilot um, um, sort of study uh, project on um, the smooth newt, which is uh, an introduced species that's just got a, a small isolated population in southeast Melbourne. Uh, so far, it hasn't spread, um, and um, and that's exactly the sort of you know population that really actually you know some sort of genetic biocontrol um, could, could completely nip it in the bud before it uh, spreads. Don't have any funding for it yet, but uh, <laughs> trying to. Um, There's but, an ad for those online <laughs> with the deep pockets. But um, yeah, I mean, I'm always on the lookout for, for, for as many different species that could be really good, especially as a proof of principle target. I mean, it, could, it may not be the first um, uh, species that actually um, has uh, gene drive thrown at it, but may well be the first one that is actually population is completely eradicated by gene drive because it's such a tiny population mm -hmm. and we don't know if it's going to sort of suddenly spread from where it is currently or not. I mean, rabbits were introduced with the first fleet, but they didn't, it was 100 years before yeah. they sort of yeah. became a pest. Talk about three, so, three yeah. attempts to get rabbits going. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, do either of you want to pick? I was just going to say, I feel like once you've got it, once you've got the, like the genetic biocontrol technologies going for something that's already here, it's kind of like 
it's less of a step to then start looking at other animals that could be going in and like monitoring them and potentially developing stuff in them as like a, a precautionary step kind of in advance. She may also need to be they also need to be preparing the population for these kinds of approaches in advance, and mm. and uh, you know the the, the rabbit, uh, sorry, the cat thing of sorrow is a great example, but you know we really need to have people prepared for this sort of stuff in advance because these things need to be done quickly when something new comes along. It's also I'm I'm really mindful of the Chalin's commentary around the by by stopping the next stuff coming in, identifying it. And we are in in that lucky way as an island. We have the ability, potentially, to invest in stopping the next wave of the things before they do come in. So, can you enjoy uh, join me in thanking all of the speakers?